Okay, can you? I am. Okay, so welcome back after the lunch break. I have the honor of chairing this session or this panel, which essentially consists of one person. I don't know if it's actually a, a, a panel. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, have Rupak Chattopadhyay, right? This Okay, here, but now it's right. <laughs> but so before we start, uh, I was asked to read out the disclaimer again. Um, so please listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you. All statements expressed by the oh my god, Bundajao Getulio Vargas, employ, uh, employees and guests in our online events and broad, broadcast exclusively represent their opinions and not necessarily FGV's institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone present here agreed to participate in this event of their own free will, and they consented to be recorded in this broadcast, which will be posted later on FGV's official channels. To continue with this transmission, we ask that you express your agreement by verbalizing or signaling your agreement. Yes, since no one disagrees. Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth, no. <laughs> okay. Oh, you signalized, okay. Um, Excellent. So uh, it's really nice that Rupak is here, um, especially because I think in one way or another he is involved or colleagues of his, of his in uh, all kinds of projects in which some of us are involved as well. And uh, the nice thing is that this gives him a very broad overview of what's happening in the federalism world. And uh, with this, I hand over to you, Rupak. Uh, thank you, Joanna, for chairing the panel and for the introduction. Uh, so my, my uh, presentation is going to be completely non-academic. I don't have a slide deck. Uh, yeah, heresy. <laughs> but but at least we're seminaring amongst consensual adults, right? I mean, this is as the disclaimer said. So no one no one is being forced to participate in the seminar. They don't want to. Uh, so what I thought I would do is to take this opportunity uh, a little bit to talk about the work of the forum and uh, what the pandemic has meant as an inflection point for the issues that we are working on and some of the trends that we've seen in federalism writ large. Uh, for those of you who don't know the forum, uh, let me provide a small introduction to how we came into being. Uh, if you remember in the mid 90s, it's too bad our colleagues from Quebec aren't here, uh, Canada had a, had a very strong separatist movement in Quebec that almost split the country. Uh, you know, fell just short, there was a referendum in 95, uh, which fell just short of whatever threshold the Quebec government thought was required to declare sovereignty. In the aftermath of that uh, referendum, the government of Canada decided to create an institution to bring in international experiences on federalism to inform the work of the government of the former federation, uh, the, the, of the government of Canada. And so that was the background to the birth of the forum. Over the last 25 odd years, uh, the forum has gone from being a service provider to the government of Canada to a platform where federal and federal type countries can come together to share experiences on how to manage, uh, how to, and, and increasingly how to set up federal systems. So it is in that context that the forum first became engaged in Brazil. Uh, over the years, uh, we have worked with the various institutions in Brazil, uh, both at the federal level, uh, at the uh, with the state governments as well, including CONFAS and and other similar uh, groupings, as well as uh, academic institutions. Uh, as I pointed out in the mor in the morning, uh, one of the one of the one of the persons I've worked with uh, closely for the longest time is Marta Recce, who I've known now for more than twenty years. Uh, in a, a doyen. <laughs> very very beginning of our careers. <laughs> And, and so it's a pleasure to be to be back to be back here, and it's it's 
and, and it's wonderful to see that some of the some of the work that for which uh, we had uh, laid the foundations in our interactions both with the federal government as well as other 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 institutions such as tax reform setting up a federation council these were all very much on the agenda 20 years ago and it's good to see these issues coming to fruition uh, in you know in 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 actually in such a short time so uh, this is this is great great news but of course in the intervening years as the title mentions uh, the title of the seminar mentions uh, we've had an emergency uh, which was of course the pandemic and then we have um, sort of a structural emergency in terms of climate change and and so that has had some bearing of course on how we think about fed federalism at the forum and the issues that we are looking at in the work uh, that that we are doing uh, about 12 years ago, the forum did some work with the uh, Australian Emergency Management Institute, uh, which is a think tank attached to the Federal Department of the Attorney General, which is uh, a Department of Justice, Interior Ministry, all rolled into one, a super ministry, if you like. And what we did on that occasion was to bring together um, disaster management specialists from about eight or nine countries, I forget exactly how many, uh, to talk about how each of these federal countries dealt with disasters. When I look back on that now, uh, you know, I, I reread the report at one point, what was very significant about that discussion was none of the none of these emergency management professionals talked about handling pandemics. You know, people, they were all, uh, they, everybody talked about managing fires, floods, uh, you know, those, those sorts of ter even terrorist attacks, but no pandemics. Uh, and so the fact that, uh, you know, the pandemic broke on us the way it did uh, was, was perhaps in hindsight, not a surprise, uh, because we certainly weren't in the headspace, especially given that earlier pandemics like SARS uh, uh, and, uh, you know, swine flu had, had burnt themselves out in a sort of in a very regional sort of setting. But the, but the pandemic, I think, is a very important inflection point uh, for federal countries. Because also before the pandemic for the World Bank, I did a study uh, where they wanted to, uh, where the World Bank wanted to be informed about how uh, apex level intergovernmental relations is carried out. So I did a, uh, 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 I think a 12 country comparison for them to see how apex level uh, intergovernmental relations is carried out in various federations. And, and what, what was remarkable there were two things, of course, first, as Alan pointed out in his federation, that in most countries, there is no statutory basis for intergovernmental relations uh, institutions. Uh, a lot of them do, do this uh, better than others. And in most countries, it was actually outside of, uh, of sectoral uh, uh, you know, IGR interactions, there, re very, there was really very little by way of apex level. I, I mean, uh, I think Alan was being modest when he said uh, uh, COAG is not what it's ranked up to be, and he's probably right about that, but it certainly does things better than many other apex level bodies do. Many countries have set up apex level uh, in interactions, you know, the prime minister and uh, uh, premiers or president and and the heads of various constituent units. But in most countries, they really didn't meet. I mean, we looked, for example, at the Council of Presidents in Spain uh, or the Interstate Council in India. And in the first two months of the pandemic, they had met more frequently than they had in the preceding 10 or 15 years. And so I think, you know, when I said the pandemic uh, uh, provided a bit of a renaissance <laughs> of intergovernmental relations. I think it, it just became one of these emergencies where it was just impossible for any one level of government, I mean, let alone any one country, to manage this on its own. But I think the pandemic also was, was a bit of an inflection point because it showed the importance of um, targeted bespoke policymaking, which made it very important for subnational governments uh, to be an important player in the process of uh, of uh, of governing a federation, um, it it sort of melded a little bit both the the difference between um, uh, uh, you know administrative and 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 sort of constitutional federalism, but also for us what was particularly interesting at the Forum of Federations is we saw a very important role that local governments had 
in, in stepping up and providing services, uh, particularly because, uh, as you know, the impact or the intensity of, of the pandemic was not uniform throughout uh, throughout any one country and, and at different points, different parts of the country of a country were affected differently. And, and the, you know, the, 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 the sort of the, uh, the, 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 the big shutdowns, lockdowns became very, very uh, 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 heavy uh, policy instrument. And so you needed these, these localized responses. But even, even more interesting for us, we saw, and because the forum is now doing some work with the OAS, uh, that in many non-federal countries or even uh, non-devolved countries, the importance that local governments acquired as a result of their role that they played uh, during the pandemic. And so, uh, you know, this this for us is is has become a very, very important area of work. Uh, when I first came to the forum, you know, 20 plus years ago, uh, I think the practitioner community, but also the academic community, had a very binary view of federalism. Uh, what do I mean by that? By that I mean they saw the world as either federal or non-federal. Uh, and of course, we know from uh, uh, you know the presentation this morning that really it is a continuum. Uh, but also, they saw the world as uh, the, as federalism as as something that was uh, that was uh, sort of relations carried out between a uh, you know a federal or national government and state or provincial government cons constituent units but of course in practice we know it's much more complex uh, than that and and has become i mean in, in of course in brazil you recognize uh, 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 local governments as a, con a constitutional order of governments this is true in many parts of the world and uh, and uh, and even uh, given what i've just said about the role of local governments in the pandemic more and more in countries where local governments are not constitutionalized they're a very important uh, player in the in the intergovernmental space in addition to that in some countries now more and more indigenous government is 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 a very important player in the scheme of intergovernmental relations so for us this is a very very important uh, uh, you know, area of, of investigation into the future. Now, think what you may of Elon Musk, but one of the most insightful things he, he ever said uh, at a W a World Economic Forum meeting some years ago is that the greatest threat to f the future prosperity of mankind is population implosion. And and we, we realize now, certainly in many parts of the world, uh, that we may have to live with some level of structural inflation because we cannot find enough trained people for the for for jobs that are uh, that need to be filled and so this has opened up for uh, for us uh, the need to think about how we you know how we can fill in for all these missing people going forward and so for the forum uh, given what has transpired during the pandemic and people opting out of the workforce uh, uh, um, you know a population implosion the whole issue of digitization and ai is going to be more and more an important issue the forum is already doing a a project on on uh, on digital digital government and i think as as uh, over time this will uh, gain greater salience in terms of the role that digitization can play in 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 provide you know ease of ease of government services, uh, but there are a lot of issues that have to be sorted out uh, in in terms of um, you know ownership of data, access, privacy, all of these issues, which uh, in many parts of the world, uh, multi you know multiple levels of government are already uh, are already uh, uh, fight, fighting over. I had the privilege uh, some months ago of attending a a foresight conference in which uh, organized by the the government of the UAE uh, where the a number of a number of European countries are beginning to think about again within the context of population explosion how they're going to replace frontline uh, uh, how they're going to replace workers in frontline services uh, with respect to the provision of social services and more and more uh, the many seem to think that auto automatization and digital uh, and 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 uh, AI uh, will help fill some of these gaps there is no clarity yet really on how 
how this might happen, but the fact that people are thinking about this is, I think, important uh, because this too will have some of the, uh, you know, concerns uh, that that digital government has raised around uh, around regulation, you know, d data ownership, privacy, uh, and 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 really uh, the space for uh, for for some national governments to. Uh, to play, I mean, we we I mean, in, in uh, we we were talking earlier about what's going on in Brazil with with VAT, uh, and and I was uh, just talking to Marta Marta Reche here about uh, about the fact that once you once you lock yourself into something like a, a national level VAT, the the room for maneuver for states becomes uh, limited. So there has to be uh, you know there has to be compensation and other ways uh, in which they can they can play a role in in in, in setting setting these uh, the, so th now the last issue that i want to touch on a little bit is uh democracy uh and really um uh, the, does federalism promote democracy or not i think alan did a good job of answering that uh, uh, you know early on the f let me start by saying the first thing is Certainly, in the certain in having so the so the forum acts as a uh, as I said you know a, a platform for learning among federal countries, but we also do a lot of work in post in post conflict settings and in in what I would call emerging democracies and emerging federations, and over the last twenty five odd years, I am increasingly coming to the conclusion, depressing as it may be, that I don't think the world is about to converge on liberal democracy. Uh, I think liberal democracy is the product of very specific historical processes, but I think uh, I, I, I do think that we will converge more and more towards uh, more representative government in some way or the other. Uh, I think federalism plays a very important uh, role in, uh, in in countries that are democratic in preventing democratic backsliding. Uh, acting again, uh, drawing on Alan's uh, presentation as a check on, uh, I forget the phrase you used, Alan, the, um, uh, where, where, where if one, one jurisdiction gives up its responsibility, somebody else who can, sh not shirking, uh, compensatory. compensatory. And, and I see this more and more in different parts of the world that federalism can play a very important role uh, in, 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 in compensating for democracy at, certain, at, 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 at various levels. Uh, but but I, 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 I do think that even in, in more and more in non-federal countries, uh, the, the move towards uh, further devolution, decentralization exists not just because, not just for, for normative reasons, but because I think this, this provides uh, an opportunity for governments to to be more responsible in 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 service delivery. So this, in a in a nutshell, is sort of my uh, overview of the direction we're going in. Uh, so I'll stop speaking here, and if there are any questions, we can we can get into a discussion. And I've been told that we have time for questions, and I get to decide who gets to ask them. So, <laughs> anyone has a a question for Rupak or a comment, of course? I don't have a microphone. Rupak, we, you and I touched on briefly before this dilemma about federalism and local government. I was just wondering if you could speak a bit more about that because there, there's a strong sense in federalism, uh, uh, when you're a student of federalism, that the more there's enhancement of local government and the more, stronger its relationship to central governments, the more federalism is undermined because it essentially goes back behind the back of the constituent units, weakens them substantially and really just enhances the the leverage enjoyed by the central government. So is the forum going to promote that kind of undermining of federalism? Is that the idea that the... <laughs> that was a cheeky bit at the end, but you know what I mean. You know but, 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 but let me let me address the, 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 the end first, <laughs> which is to say very categorically that the forum doesn't promote anything, not even federalism. <laughs> Well, no, no, we, we're not. A, we're not. A, we're not an advocacy organization. Uh, 
so so we but we're a learning organization we bring you a menu and you you tell us you know what it is you would you would like to have off the menu you know do you want it rare medium rare and then we can we can prepare it that way but but i think i think there is something to that i think when you when you have multiple layers multiple orders of government in any system i think i think all the, all orders have to be engaged uh, i i don't i you know i don't want to speak specifically to the brazil uh, uh, the, the Brazilian case, but I certainly know of other countries where the constitutionalization of local government was a deliberate ploy by federal governments to to bypass states that had been in opposition. I, I don't know that for a fact in Brazil, but it certainly could be the case. But it doesn't work because uh, you know everyone has to row in the in the same direction if you're going to deliver services uh, uh, in, in an effective manner. Otherwise, there's always somebody in the system who's putting a, a, a you know, a, a spoke in the a wheel, so to speak. Elizabeth? Yeah, thank you. Elizabeth Alba, Eurek Research. So if the forum kind of offers a menu, <laughs> what you just said, and uh, drawing on the comment uh, you made earlier that obviously the forum is also working um, in emerging situations, let's say, then the problem is what comes first, or how does it come in, in the same way? Come in, does federalism come first, or democracy come first? Or what, what is taking first from the menu? <laughs> if the forum doesn't say what should come first, what do most of the emerging federal, let's say, whatever, power states, countries, however we want to define them, what do they ask first? Do they ask first democratization and then federalization or do they ask first uh, federalization as they, in the sense of uh, state capacity even though it might be on the local level because it's mostly local level that relates to Ellen because there you don't have the intermediate level because that's very often to my knowledge also the problematic level <laughs> so you bypass it okay no I think that's a very important question and you know there, there is no uh, I don't think there's a straight answer to that uh, because it, it really depends on the context where this kind of advice is being asked. In uh, Certainly, you know, we, we have internalized sort of at the forum of those of us uh, who've worked in this area for a long time, that when we talk of federalism, we talk about democratic federalism, right? It's, it's sort of internalized in, in the literature, the way we think about it. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, there are many situations, uh, particularly post-conflict or uh, conflict situations, where the, where the first, where the, f the, the, the priority for, for people in, or, or for stakeholders in this context is to end the conflict. And 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 that's a whole you know there's a whole different literature there about the sequencing, uh, but as, uh, is it possible to have? Uh, yeah, I think in rare cases it's possible to have a federal system that is not democratic, or or at least have a system that, uh, or, or there are systems where there is what I would call a democratic deficit. Uh, but but I think in most of these post-conflict situations, it's first about ending the conflict and coming to a um, uh, com coming to an agreement on the division of powers. Uh, but but these but if you if you then don't follow that up with some kind of democratic setup, uh, you know these are these are temporary solutions that are doomed to fail. Uh, so yeah, the sequencing question is a big question. It's an open question, but I think it's but they have to they do have to go together. I have a question about uh, federal councils and to, to, to about your thoughts about that, because uh, sometimes I have the impression that is there is a, a positions about uh, federal councils are are as like there were only two options or abiding, uh, um, let's say federal council in the sense that decisions taken by this uh, council should. Uh, bind the government or an ineffective uh, one so if it's not binding it's uh, it's in effect ineffective but there is a third uh, alternative that would be a non-binding uh, federal council would be a, an important fort for consultation for to frame federal policies in the sense that uh, listening uh, the those that are in charge of implementing policies presenting their difficulties and their positions would would turn it uh, possible to frame better federal policies so i'd like to hear you uh, because you were just the heavy i 
this discussion now in Brazil, and uh, I think this is an important sure, point. No. Of I mean, uh, you know, as a Canadian, um, uh, that's a very important question because in Canada, uh, provinces uh, provinces are fiscally very, very independent. Uh, 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 tr uh, tr uh, federal transfers to the provinces are only about 7% of, of uh, federal government revenue. So they're very, very small, which gives, so you, in, in, in a first minister's meeting in Canada, you cannot force a province to go down a road that it doesn't want to. So everything that comes out of first ministers' meeting in, in, in first ministers' meetings in Canada really is is non-binding, and so what the federal government does is it where where it has agreement it goes out and does you know does does deals on a, on a bilateral basis with provinces if it can't but but so the Canadian model very much is that uh, where the where the first ministers' meet, meetings are opportunities for provinces and the federal government to discuss as co-equals really. Uh, various issues in federalism. I mean, even when Canada uh, implemented the GST, or, or we call it the HST, the Harmonized Sales Tax, uh, not all provinces signed up for it. In fact, some of the biggest provinces were holdouts for for decades before before coming on board. So, so yes, that's that's very much a possibility to have a have that option where there, where decision making is is non binding. Maybe if I may add to, to this, I think that's actually the model that in, in all countries. I don't know of any federation where uh, decisions by such a body are, are legally binding mm -hmm. because it's elected governments that meet. So I think it would even be problematic potentially if they were in any case in any way binding because binding decisions are made by parliaments, not executives. Um, and the, the, only in, the only case I know is in, uh, in Switzerland where intergovernmental agreements can be declared binding by the federal government upon request of 18, I think, cantons. There's a certain, a certain uh, rule and these are often made within, within a conference, but that's the only case I know where legally binding um, decisions can be made by, but even then they're not made by the council, but by a federal government, i.e. federal parliament. So I think what you're talking about is actually the model that occurs everywhere. So then the question is, should there be a way of making these agreements a bit more binding for them not to just be, or for, let's say for governments not just to say yes to something that they're not going to, to implement, which raises a whole lot of other questions. Um, but over to Rogerio. The last one. <clears throat> um, I'm uncomfortable uh, each time that someone's in the in the seminar mentions that associates democracy and federalism, because I hear you say Brazil wasn't a federation from 1964 to 1985. Brazil wasn't a federation from 1937 to 1945. And I'd like to think with you that perhaps um, it's not just a question to, to keep uh, federalism working at, in place. It's not just a question of, of having, a, for instance, a, a review court capable of uh, obliging the central government to respect the rights of the constituent, constituent units. Because if, if we think about the, the idea of a rob, robust federations, there are other factors that count regarding the, the maintenance of the federation equilibria, equilibrium. And that is the case of Brazil, because can you think, uh, even when we had a, an authoritarian regime, uh, or even when we had a, a regime of one man, uh, the dictatorship of Getúlio Vargas, you always have to have support, support from regional elites, support from regional publics. So you, 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 are, you have to uh, deal with this. And that's why I think that we have to, to, to be a little more, a little more um, careful when we make this association. It's a comment, but of course, uh, I'd like to hear about this. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in Nigeria of the 1980s. And Nigeria is a federation, uh, was a military dictatorship for 
a long, long periods of time. And I completely, I hear and, and I agree with what you're saying, which is why my, you know, my, my response was it's, 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 there's no easy answer to the, I mean, but, but still, you know, I, I, the, the, the idea that the federal idea that we have internalized is one of democratic federalism. But, but it is possible to have federations that are not, uh, that are not democratic. And, and of course, in a country like Nigeria, with its vast, uh, 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 you know, linguistic, tribal, ethnic uh, differences, even even if you are a military dictator, you have to take that into account when you appoint a cabinet, uh, when you hand out, uh, you know, appointments in government, when you make policy. So yes, that's very much the case. I mean, there are a lot of Germans here, and you know, one of the things I like to say is I think Germany was more federal before 1919 than it is today. <laughs> so, so so there's a there's an argument. Uh, to be made there, uh, that that you can, uh, you know, f federalism is uh, is should uh, in in theory, uh, I think, a democratic idea, but in practice, of course, there there can be uh, there can be some some uh, some leeway in in how that's done. Uh, it, you know, it's it's interesting uh, what you mentioned because this touches on some work that the forum is doing now. Uh, before the civ current civil war in in Yemen, the forum was very involved in uh, supporting the. The, the national the national uh, dialogue there, which was looking towards creating a, a, fed, a federal Yemen. Uh, Yemen is a very interesting country because um, if you if you speak to Yemenis individually, they'll tell you they have very strong local identities. You know, I'm I'm an Adeni, I'm a, a Hadrami. But if you but if you ask them, but are you Yemeni? They'll all say they're Yemeni. But but it just means it's and so we're now working with the uh, UN Special Envoy's office. On, um, uh, uh, it, it, I don't want to say disarmament, but beginning at least in the south to have a discussion about creating some national institutions, including a national military, and 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 uh, so so they were looking for you know what are, what are some of the contemporary examples to look at of how you create uh, how you create a, a country or a or national institutions from these disparate. Uh, uh, local, you know, local armed groups. So how do you create a national army from disparate armed groups? And I said, you know, the, the example that you have to look at is not a 20th century example. The example you have to look at is German unification. You have to look at 1866, you have to look at 1871. So it is possible to create a state uh, where, uh, a functioning state, where the Hadramis can have their own army, uh, the Adenis can have their own army, and then to to, when, you, when you start building national institutions, uh, particularly on the military side, because this is a military militarized conflict, you start building, uh, you know, a national military institution that nobody really cares about. So if you build a Yemeni navy, you know, no Yemeni cares if it's a, you know, if it's a national institution because uh, they see soldiers on the street. They want it to be their, you know, their local people who have arms. They, you know, Hadrami doesn't want somebody from Aden or uh, from uh, Thais to come. Uh, with guns to their city. So that's what they care about. So it, again, you know, again, I, I don't want to take the German example too far, uh, but but it was, you know, the, even after 1871, uh, there was no German army. It was a Prussian army, it was a Bavarian army, it was a Saxon army, uh, but it was it was an imperial navy. It was, that was the national institution, right? Because most Germans hadn't seen the sea and couldn't care less. <laughs> and, and similarly, you know, most Yemenis haven't seen <laughs> it. So, so, you know, all, all this to say that the idea of creating, the idea of, uh, of the federal idea having some compatibility with the, uh, uh, so, or, have, or using a federal solution in a non-democratic sense, yeah, there, there is something, there is something to it. But, but very quickly, again, you do need some kind of uh, for for a federation to work, you need some some uh, mechanism, a referee who can who can rule when there are disputes in in a, in a free and fair fa manner, and that that I think is where the federal idea, uh, the the democratic idea of federalism comes in. So I don't know if I've answered your question. Okay, and speaking of non-democratic, the big, big boss has decided this would be <laughs> the last question. And uh, with this, I thank you very much, Rupak, again, for your uh, talk and answer. And I'll hand over to you. I hope I haven't uh, offended my German colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> Well, 
uh, I really do believe that this discussion, it was a good preparation for our next section, exactly because we will deal with federalism and democracy. So I believe that every, everyone planning to discuss this topic in order to prepare the session. And now we will have the great pleasure to receive Professor Jair Sonicsen from Germany. In fact, I really believe again, forgot again, University, Darmstadt, Darmstadt, yeah, okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> But you can introduce yourself if you want. And, and after the, 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 the talk from Professor Jarek Sonnesen, we will have uh, through Zoom uh, the comments from our colleague at the Tula Vargas Foundation, Professor Fernando Brusio, who is follow us through Zoom right now. Professor Fernando Brusio also. I'm here. For your participation in this session. And also, Professor Jarek, thank you so much for comment to Brazil and also to participate in this uh, seminar. So the word is yours. Okay. Um, well, <clears throat> the thanks and gratitude are, are all mine. I, it's such, such a pleasure to be here. Um, this morning when we were being welcomed, um, and there are a few side uh, particular notes to the guests who have come from abroad, how they uh, about wanting to learn from us. But if I may be completely honest, um, my motivation is learning from you. I hope to do some justice to your motivation to have something to present. But uh, I'm so full of gratitude to learn from an exchange with, with with you. And I've already this the, already today learned so much and filling up a lot of notes. And this is this is wonderful. So thank you. Um, to everyone, also um, Eduardo, Rogerio, and Johanna for bringing us together, and, and also so many uh, of you have taken your time. Um, nevertheless, I do have a job to do, and that's to present, <laughs> and I will try, <laughs> despite that, um, I'm not trying to get out of my responsibility. So, um, ah, do I switch, do I have to do something to switch it to this side, or is it? Yeah, and then I need to know how to move them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. uh, I will. Thank you. But maybe I'll, while that's getting set up, I can still continue. So, so, I, so there's already been quite a bit of talk um, and mentioning of federalism and democracy, and their their comp thank you their complex relationship, and I. That's not a puzzle I'm going to be able to solve, I believe, about um, does federalism strengthen democracy or vice, vice versa. I think the, the, the answers have already been given, some, at least the bottom line, that they're in a complex relationship. Um, nevertheless, um, can I, which direction should I point? Sorry. <laughs> ah, now, that worked. It seems to be working now. Obrigado. Um, in the context also of emergencies, um, the federalism, democracy, and then adding being in an era of emergencies. And I, I, I like this, this, this title as well. Um, I'm playing with the title a bit. I believe that this is no coincidence in the era of, um, of, of corona, post-corona, or at least post-pandemic, right? Corona we still have to deal with in COVID-19. But there are multiple reasons to think about why we are in an era of emergencies, and the COVID-19 pandemic is only one of them. But spe speaking specifically briefly about federalism and democracy in this context of emergencies and crises, well, we know there are always a particular challenge, but for federal democratic systems, already federal systems and democratic federal relations, there are particular challenges. For example, the reasons are multiple. We have a division of authority um, that may not always be clear cut which level, which constituency, jurisdiction, and so forth is responsible for dealing with the issue. This is a formal constitutional issue. It becomes a democratic one as well, right? We have popular governments who might even have an incentive to shirk and put blame somewhere else. And this is sort of programmed into the, the system. So it makes things complex. We also see federalism. Uh, Daniel Bailon spoke, I think, focused more on responses to crises. 
I think um, when I thought about that, afterwards we could also ask about what does a federal system do to a crisis in a sense, right? Because um, we have the, the pandemic, the pandemos, something that affects all of the people that knows no borders. And yet, because of how a federal system is configured, all of a sudden you have to have a Sao Paulo versus Minas Gerais or Nordrhein-Westfalen versus Berlin or Texas and Alaska responding to the same thing that affects all people irrespective of territorial boundaries. So in some ways, federalism does something to a crisis. It becomes something that has to be treated different. It's not only a response to conflict, it's not only a response to diversity, it creates a sort of endemic diversity, I think. And that's not a critical reflection, that's just sort of a reconceptualization about what federalism does to us in federal systems. Um, but in any case, we've seen a good deal of research about um, federal systems responding. Um, how they responded to the pandemic and they were we see differences also depending on uh, federal systems um but i would say this era again this era of emergencies notion extends further than also clear-cut concrete uh crises and critical junctures uh, for for multiple reasons we've already since what is that the 90s with Ulrich, uh, Ulrich beck and the risk society which is not only about an increasing amount of risk, but an increasing sensitivity to risk and, 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 and future orientation and how and, and responsibility we have not only for dealing in an ad hocracy and things in, in the now, but also our commitments to future generations and those sort of things. Um, I'm not going anywhere with that in particular, but brainstorming a bit and what, what does that mean to be in an era of emergencies? Though, and I will talk about this more in the conclusion maybe, that vulnerability um, is perhaps a, an, a, an increasingly important or salient thing we've learned maybe being in an era of crises or at latest in the pandemic um, that could be an important issue to think about moving forward about the relationship between uh, federalism and democracy. So I've already concluded the introductory part. I'd like to move in the next step to some brief remarks about the, po the political, not a recapitulation of the entire history of politics, I don't mean, but um, I think some of the issues we're dealing with um, have to do very much with how politics is done and organized, but why they become more complex than in the democratic and federal uh, conditions. Um, and the third step then, my 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 task in the stricter sense to reflect on the relationship between federalism and democracy what connects them and what challenges of them in particular so in, a, in i guess a two to three step process i'd like to say well why are they different what do they have in common and what are some of their particular challenges democracy to federalism and vice versa and finally conclude with some food for thought uh, about federalism and democracy in an era of emergencies so really briefly on the political, um, we, had the, we had the request to think about what, uh, I really like this idea of a think and do tank. Um, and I'm as, as, as inspired as I am by that, I will commit the same mis mistake or weakness that many social scientists do. I'm doing a much better job at finding problems than solving them, <laughs> but that could be a good way to start. Um, so one thing we have to do is try to untangle things, right, into their various parts. Knowing full well, oftentimes we're dealing with knots, right? Uh, but in order to understand them, let alone explain things, we have to try and make sense of them and disentangle them. And in many ways, this is a good image, I think, or I find it fitting to the relationship between federalism and democracy or politics in general. So to make a long story short about why some of what we're talking about is interesting in federalism and democracy, but also in general, when thinking about the political. Well, one of the things is that we've inherited over a, a long time of political development or evolution, a, a very tight interconnection between, well, what I summarize with consonants P, the polity, political community, the distribution of power, constitutional and legal principles, people, whether they are the demos or a population or citizenry, whatever these people are, 
and their place. So this is not self-evident for all of us. It may be now, at least for a century or two. It may be to a certain extent particularly weird. Um, I don't know if you know that abbreviation um, from recent psychology, Western educated, industrialized, rich and developed. So there's this weird <laughs> weirdness to the modern state, right, whether coming from Europe or colonized and imperial um, and expanded, but this sort of connection is not self-evident and not really all that old, but there we have it, right, and it's embounded and entangled with each other, um, whether in federalism or democracy, that's sort of how the modern state is, that on the development to whatever the modern state is and, and, and sovereignty where political power is then located, in the world in territory and the political becomes territorially organized so that's a way of organizing the political um, in 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 general but then you add to that so that the sovereignty whether that's autonomy whatever we want to call it, political power basic political power is somehow located in spaces of the earth <laughs> and divided along territorial lines and then add to that a second, I think, important egalitarian referent. We have the sovereignty of the state and then the sovereignty of people, right? And that's something typical of modern state and becomes more complex in democratic states so that we have not only the constituent multitude of the state of sovereignty, but also a multitude of constituents or multiple constituents. So that's where we are in a certain extent, the conditions under which we live in the political that become more complex in federalism democracy. But in general, and, and perhaps an oversimplification, my attempt to map the tensions in, 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 in politics that become all the more tense when you have, when, when, the, when, when the people are democratically organized because that multiplies once more who that that, that multitude of constituencies, right? We have this constituent multitude, a demos or citizenry or whatever that is versus the multitude of constituents. And then we have some sort of problems. Those could be crisis situations, but I think those are exceptional to a certain extent. Um, any problem in, that has to be resolved politically, so collectively bindingly, not just a manager and a company or uh, a family, two people, three people discussing, but for a collectively binding decision that's endowed with some sort of powers that may or may be located where the place is of that problem. So that's why I have the arrows pulling in different directions against the problems that must be resolved. And so I would say that's particularly in a democratic situation. We have the problems that we face, a distribution of powers, different competing or at least concurring principles linked with whether that's the way it should be done or not and they may overlap or not with where they are territorially organized who are the people affected the demos is the extreme form the pandemos all of the people right that's in the word itself um or so well um, i'll elaborate this further here in the next step what am i getting at well, we have the boundedness of, 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 of politics, all politics, with multiple contingencies. Um, it has to do with jurisdictions or where, where, where this powers are distributed, whether by levels, vertically or horizontally, um, in addition to the complications of veto players, competing interest conflicts, competing ideas, and so forth. Um, so in addition to the existence of multiple bounds and boundaries that political decision making and dealing with a crisis or any problem must deal with, um, another issue, a challenge are the incongruencies, the mismatches between responsibilities, resources, powers, and effectiveness. Um, and these become particularly, so the problem scope may not match with the authority that is responsible for that. And this becomes particularly a challenge when we have to do with cross-jurisdictional and cross-sectoral tasks that, that cut across multiple policy areas. So at the bottom line, potentials for 
tensions and even frictions. Um, this becomes now particularly challenging. I know some of you know the old um, model by, by, by Easton, the simplified model of the political system. Um, I don't know if I've made it better by doing this, but, you, <laughs> uh, but if we disaggregate that black box a bit, the, what the really, and this is with, where the relevance, particularly to federalism and democracy comes, is we actually have, we, even if we forget the black box, that environment that the one particular system must deal with that operates by its own functional logic must now be, what, depending on how coupled or loosely coupled it is to that other system, has some sort of relation or interaction with the other ones. It could be the federal system, it could be the party system, it could be the interest mediation system, it could be the media system. They all interact and operate using different rules of the game, and so on and so forth. So going from there is where we get, and you can, uh, with the mechanics of federalism and democracy, is one of the particular challenges, I would not say federal democracy is necessary for federalism particularly. My heart would say, yes, democracy is, it doesn't make sense. A federal system nowadays would not make much sense, so certainly not be the kind of federation I would want to live in if it wasn't dem democratic, and it's certainly, um, but in and of itself, conceptually, um, we could say, okay, federalism can exist. It does <laughs> without democracy, and certainly democracy can exist without federalism. Most of the democracies we know aren't federal. Um, but the question is whether the federation, well, their relationship to one another is not to subsume them under another at the bottom line, irrespective of the normative thinking, but to see them as two different systems operating under different functional logics. So depending on focus, we would have the democratic governmental system in the box, and federalism would be one of the other systems, uh, and so on and so forth. So we should treat probably federalism and democracy as distinct. Some of you may know Arendt Leipart's Patterns of Democracy. Um, and to make a long story short, the contrast that's a modern classic typology contrasting the Anglo-Saxon, British, and American systems versus um, uh, some more, well, uh, his basis was originally Switzerland and then <coughs> Switzerland and, 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 and the Netherlands. But in any case, the point is, in, in, in Leipart's typology, and several have emulated this notion, and it's a longstanding idea, federalism is treated in that typology as a part of democracy, as a part of that model. And I would, I would say that that's sort of a confusing way of treating federalism. As many of you know, and we've talked about, federalism is not necessarily democratic, let alone a subtype of democratic models. Um, they're actually two different ways of organizing a political system. What they do have in common, and uh, Alan Fenn already spoke to that, is um, they're about dividing power. They're sort of an antithesis to concentration of power. If you think about it, democracy at the core is also a division of power. That's not to say separation of power is the same thing as democracy. Of course, you're going to have separation of powers without democracy. There are many non-dictatorial autocracies. But democracy is in of itself, by nature, a division of power into 100 million people, or 300 million people, or 80 million people, whatever. The, 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 this, con this multitude of constituents, the demos as a constituent multitude is also a multitude or manifold constituents. And federalism is also not about concentrating power, but dividing power. So that they share in common, but they're two different dimensions of government. One is an intergovernmental relationship between levels of government and democracy, that being federalism, and democracy about a division of authority among branches of government. Footnote, I'm talking about representative democracy um, from Elizabeth, we'll hear more later about also participatory forms and, and so forth. So I'm, I, I'm still the old fashioned representative democracy right now. <laughs> okay, so when you add those two together in one polity, what you have is a multi-dimensional government, so in multiple dimensions. And for multiple reasons. For one reason, because having a democratic 
government and a federal system not only creates relationships between particular relationships between branches of government and levels of government. Those are the default settings constitutionally, but also because in practice they must interact with one another. So governing under these conditions, and that's where things get complicated. At latest, they interact with one another. So a political party, it becomes difficult to disaggregate at a certain point what is federal about the party system or what is democratic about it what is right and the way politics occurs there are mutual influences between the democratic rules of the game and the federal rules of the game right we might attribute the political party system to the more democratic dimension and that's all well and good but in federal systems it may well be the case that party differentiation occurs not only for ideological reasons but for regional reasons or there are incentives created for parties to differentiate themselves across those and so on and so forth. So there's mutual interactions and influences going on. So federalism changes democracy as does democracy change federalism. So it's a complex relationship. Nevertheless, in trying to, I should be very quick, um, in trying to um, make sense of, in some ways, the federalism and democracy well, what connects them, what challenges them, how do we distinguish them? Well, they can be distinguished in ways that make them similar. What do I mean by that? Going up the ladder of abstraction, as Satori calls it. Well, they share, again, division of powers. At the core, they're both about dividing of powers, but their points of reference are different conceptually or theoretically, right? The, in, in, in demos, again, in democracy, the people in federal systems, predominantly territorial. Footnote, this is a simplification because territory in political terms is not that interesting if there aren't people there, right? Federalism is only interesting for populated places. So this is schematic. Of course, federalism also about people who live somewhere and are affected by, by things. But footnote aside, so um, division of powers, again, in democracy, intragovernmental, within one government, federal, between governments. Um, Equality, both are concerned with equality, but different kinds in citizens versus territorial units or constituent units. Both require representation, participation, but we're talking about different units or entities. The simplified version then. So democracy, the constitutional organizational principle is about organizing a demos and federalism of fruitus or territorial organization. Division of powers between branches versus levels of government. Both fundamentally at their core involve constituency, the representation, participation, and inclusion of constituents, but those constituents are different points of reference again, whether it's citizens or places. Um, and in theory, equality. There are differences in federal system and practice that don't have an equal representation, but Brazil is a case where, irrespective of population, the, the states are equally represented, as is in the case in Switzerland and the, the United States and elsewhere. Okay, so um, let, let me skip a couple of these. I, um, this is just proof that I actually did my homework. Uh, <laughs> The, the long story short is that it gets more complicated when we ask the relationship between federalism and democracy because the question should be which democracy are we talking about and which federalism are we talking about because each are within their own quite different. So let me skip to this one that, that I think gives an overview of where I'm getting. And this is only talking in terms of classic representative democracy, or if we try to map this relationship. Um, so if we look at the democratic horizontal dimension as in a spectrum between more separation of powers and sharing of powers, as some of you may know, if not all, that classic dualism from Elazar between self-rule and shared rule uh, in federal systems. Um, but in any case, that's the inspiration. Um, um, which is not my own, but was born out of my postdoc work coming into um, comparative federalism with Arthur Benz together about these relationships between federalism and democracy, complicating them a bit. And 
adapting that notion by uh, Elazar, we can we can also in democratic terms a tendency more towards separating or sharing power. Both we see this in federalism and in 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 in, in democracy. Then different tendencies. And that allows for different combinations. And voila, we can create a four field matrix of different kinds of patterns of federalism and democracy. So not just the one relationship, but maybe four different combinations. So for example, in the democratic dimension, if you have a, a government that's more prone towards dividing powers, as is typical in a presidential system, president, well, as we have here in Brazil or the United States or Mexico, most of the um, South and uh, uh, Central and South American countries in the U.S. Um, outside of that, you'll find very few presidential democracies. But nevertheless, that's the that's the strict separation of powers in the executive versus legislative. And we may find that in federalism as well that there's more of a stricter separation between the levels. So um, the U.S. would fit up into this upper left corner. Brazil might be more toward on the left side but more towards the lower uh, bottom if it's a marble cake federal system um, we could have a division of powers dual federalism system and a more parliamentary model fusion between executive and legislative um, canada might be a case of this over here to the right at the top um, whereas a, a, a system combining a very strong fusion of powers in the, between executive and legislative, so parliamentary democracy, um, as well as a, a strong cooperative model, um, administrative federalism or joint decision making. So the, ter the constituent units co-produce policies of the federal level. Uh, I don't think we have a pattern like this in Brazil, but Germany is the classic case of this work with co-production of national level policy um, then implemented by the constituent units, um, which makes it, side note, very difficult in the German case, at least, to determine what is centralization and decentralization. There are decisions at national level, but they're co-produced by the state level, so it's 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 ambivalent. So this produces different patterns. So this doesn't determine policy outcomes. Is a long story. We don't know about the relationship between one improving the other. What we do can say, though, is that not only is the relationship complex, I tried to make the notes with similar examples. I took Switzerland in the bottom left. I could have taken as well, knowing more after today, could have taken the Brazilian case as well. Um, we know about different patterns of federalism, democracy, and interlinkages. So a tightly coupled system might produce more stronger interactions between the federal and the democratic uh, dimension. Um, the, the strongly uncoupled, so you think back to this abstraction, um, depending on where we zoom in, what this relationship is, maybe a tight coupling between the two, and it, or it might be a loose coupling, and they interfere and interact with each other very little. Um, if that makes sense. So in this case, we have a very tight coupling also between the federal and the democratic regimes. Right? State level actors are deciding at national level at um, what uh, policy that they'll implement. But what this also means is a tight coupling between federalism and democracy because the democratic rules of the game at state level interfere or affect, they can interrupt <laughs> um, the, the federal, the national policy making, right? If, for example, if government opposition dynamics at state level play a role now at national level, because these are the actors deciding at national level here. Whereas the dual federal model means more space and scope for unilateralism, less room for interference in the, between the two levels. But what it may also mean is that they don't solve cross-cutting problems very well, right? So if everybody can do it on their own, right? It's autonomy preserving, but there might be very little incentive to work together, whether between levels or vertically, because they're not forced to. 
And then add to that, um, in the parliamentary systems, we hear a lot about intergovernmental coordination. There's more to come uh, in the next days. But a highly decoupled system might even provide rewards or incentives not to cooperate. Take the, the US case with the governors, all 50 governors would meet, and then make an agreement, and then go back home. Their separately elected legislatures may have absolutely no reason to agree to what those 50 governors agreed to. They may even be electorally rewarded for not doing it. So there's different, so the decoupled model allows for more slack, but it might be less prone to resolving cross-cutting, cross-jurisdictional problems, also because the system doesn't require it. So what do we learn from all of that? Well, I'm not quite sure, <laughs> other than some unsurprising conclusions, namely that, OK, it's all, I, I, yeah, I'm getting, yeah, OK, yes. Um, OK, the relationship is complex, but that's not to say complicated, that's just complicated. By complex, I mean with literally complex. It's multidimensional. Um, and that means federalism and democracy were within their government, multidimensional, and how they govern, but also with regard to processes. So not just the default settings, the constitutional organization of government and how it's governed, but rather that the relationship is one of interactions that affects each other. Also because, as we've heard, that well, this, multiple, this mutual constitutiveness of federalism and democracy in the constitutional terms um, becomes more complex over time because of interactions. And as we as heard, you know, most modern problems are not local. Or even if they are, they have effects that cross territories. Um, what do I mean more specifically? Well, sometimes federalism is treated as a kind of democratic response to diversity. Or it may be a democratic response to conflict. But actually, federalism is also a conflict transformation. Political conflicts never end. It becomes a new way of pacifying, hopefully pacifying conflicts. But conflicts still happen, and they have to be resolved. So, but that also means a now you have territorial units that produce decisions, right? They have autonomy. But that means if federalism was once a way of dealing with a conflict, if they, now you've created the spaces and spaces for producing new kinds of externalities. So constituency state A or state B or region C makes a decision that now may have implications that cross a border. Right? Even a seemingly local issue may have effects on people in other places. Regulating COVID, regulating climate change, or not regulating climate change, right? Things that cross borders have to be. So they, they pull effects on others that now have to be addressed. In other terms, over time, we need a way to manage interdependence. And federalism and democracy is a particularly complex way of dealing with interdependencies, not just securing autonomy. That sounds normative, and I will admit it is normative, <laughs> but I think it's also purely analytical, the way it is in a, comp in a complex world. So everyday policymaking is a challenge for federal democracies, managing cross-cutting tasks and independencies. Um, those are some analytical takeaways on the relationship and dealing with problems in particular. But what does that mean in an era of crises? Well, to some extent, um, like we have in a crisis, the code red. <laughs> How do we deal with a crisis? Or, um, well, there's always a crisis, so we need to keep on, um, we need to um, muddle through. I've got one minute. So, okay, crises reveal particular federal democratic challenges. That was already the case at latest in climate change. Um, should have been, but COVID-19 uh, made that particularly um, obvious. So we're stuck though with what, other than a, a public health crisis, 
Um, what I think, again, w this issue of vulnerability on a global scale became palpable, feelable in everyday life. But we're still stuck with this conundrum that I was talking about with the political, the territorial boundedness of people, politics, places, powers, right? That, and dealing with problems that cross cut them. So that's the particular, particularity of crisis that they, be, they need to be resolved in a much quicker sense. They may be more dramatic, but all collective action problems are connected. This connects in a more general sense to federalism and democracy. They just become perhaps more urgent in the crisis. Um, and dealing with collective action problems, what I sub summarize as ours, involves having a distribution of rights and rules and mutual recognition and perhaps a relationship of reciprocity, some repeating forms of cooperation in order to deal with collective action problems. Um, so there are various modes, and I said, well, I said that there's a complex relationship between the two, and there's no proper solution. I think at the bottom line, the relationship between federalism and democracy is also one of a dilemma. Now that sounds more negative than I mean it. It's just a dilemma cannot be solved, but you can cope with it. You can cope with the tensions. And I think there are better, certain good democratic and federal ways of dealing with um, tensions. Well, one of them is, and I'm almost done. If you think of Hirschman, the famous exit and voice, right? I mean, the crisis comes, you need an escape route. <laughs> um, Right? An escape, whether that's secession in the strictest sense in federal terms or in other ways, autonomy, allowing slack, unilateralism, people to do their own thing, not to disrupt one another. And that's all well and good. It's also important maybe to have that as an anticipatory effect that we can negotiate under the shadow of the ability to escape. Right? We don't have to do it, but knowing that we can can help. However, if we play around with Hirschman's concept, uh, again, with exit and voice. Well, voice is a particularly important one as well. Another way of dealing with the crisis situation as with everyday, everyday politics is guaranteeing voice. Oh, rights, rights to participate. I, what did I, I pressed something on accident. Can you set me back up, sorry? Ah, sorry. I'm back. Um, is having, yeah, sorry, um, rights to, to participate and guaranteeing participation opportunities for bringing in voice and mediation. So not just allowing exit and unilateralism and escape routes, but also ways for participation. That would be the scene to me, a democratic and, okay, I think I, and federal way. The other, the other, um, the third point by, by Hirschman with that exit and voice, though that's often left out, I find, is also loyalty. <laughs> and I think there are two federal de and democratic goods that they share that remind of loyalty to a community. Not only the promise of self-rule, but also comity or shared rule. Or in democratic, not only the promise of liberty, but also equality. So modern political problems are not only complex, I think, and this is what federal democracy and a more cooperative oriented relationship to the two reminds us and at latest also in the context of the, the pandemic and other crises is that we need cooperative institutions, ones that enable cross-jurisdictional participatory, um, participatory um, um, forums. Now they don't have to be compulsory and harmonious and unitary, that's not what I mean, but ways of bringing together. So federal democracy is a balancing act <laughs> uh, um, between self and shared rule autonomy and interdependence. Um, but my last point is also, and I think one that I don't have an answer to, but if the food for thought is I wonder what the pandemic tells us about vulnerability. If we go away from autonomy to more concentration on vulnerability um, as the conditio humana, in general, what sort of implications does that have for how federalism and democracy should work? Thank you.
Thank you, Jared. It's a very interesting provocation. I think we have a lot of topics to discuss after the comments from Professor Fernanda Brucio. I think now uh, Professor Fernanda Brucio is my colleague at Chetilo Vargas Foundation. Welcome to Professor Fernanda Brucio to this panel. Now the word is yours. You have 30 minutes. I will warn you when we reach 25 minutes, okay? Thank you. So, oh. the word is Thank you so much. Yes, uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, I don't know for... what's happening with the sound. Uh, one, mom, one moment, Robrucio. Okay. We cannot hear you. Uh, you, you, you check your microphone, Abruzio. My microphone is, is. Yeah, yeah, no, yes, exactly. Now it's okay, exactly. This was your problem. <laughs> I <laughs> think <okay>. so. <laughs> well, thanks for the invitation, Eduardo. Um, first of all, I would like to to apologize for not being in person at the event. But I had a personal problem. I'm sorry. Tomorrow I will be with you in the in the after, afternoon. I hope so. My name is Fernanda Bruce. I'm a professor at Fundação Getúlio Vargas. I will try to share my my presentation here, please. Uh, Maybe you, you could click on this uh, in Portuguese, compartilhar slide or share the slide, almost like this. This is a green button, um, okay? You see in the bottom of the, the screen. Did you find it? Wait a minute. Yes. Uh, Professor Fernando Bus is also easy to use his slides. See, yes. yes. Did you see this green button? Yes, I see. I yeah, saw yeah. That. You should click on. Yes, I think now it's working. Okay. No, it's not working. Well. I can no, no. try again, try again. Yeah, yeah, now it's okay. Thank you. Now you can see your slides. Possible. No, previously the, the, the slides were, ah, okay, were okay. working well. And yes, okay. Okay? No, 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 no. Again, uh, you should you, you should share your slide and using this green button. Yeah, I, I I cannot see, but I cannot read. But maybe compartilize the slide or share the slide. I don't know how it's appearing uh, to you. Uh, but but now you can use these means of presentation. No, Bruce, it's not working like this. Oh. Don't worry. Don't worry. You can go. Uh, yeah, yeah. Please, please click on click click on this bullet. Uh, the guys are, are warning me that you could uh, use this F uh, F five button. Uh, 
Yeah. F5 button, I presume. Or. Yeah, this is five, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. If you don't mind, okay, and you can go like this, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you so much for the audience. So, Bruce, you go ahead like this. Okay, I'm sorry, but <laughs> it's a complicated day. Well, uh, it was a pleasure to listen to Professor Sonix, and now you try to make um, a synthetic dialogue with his ideas about federalism and democracy, uh, analyzing the Brazilian case. Um, the title of my presentation, Federalism and Democracy in Brazil, from mismatch to incomplete marriage, is a kind of joke with the idea of, of marriage between uh, federalism and democracy, a uh, marriage that will never be perfect, like our marriage, but they could be better, improve it, um, according to according the, the history of each federation. Uh, in my case, in Brazilian federation. I have uh, three main arguments. Um, the first argument is that federalism and democracy were dissociated during Brazilian history until the 1988 constitution. So um, the marriage between federalism and democracy is very, very recent. This is different from American, Canadian, or German federalism. In fact, the institutional coupling is recent because there was neither full democracy nor full federalism until redemocratization in Brazil. Um, the second the argument is Brazilian democratic federalism has advanced a lot, a lot in the last few years with many institutional innovations. Uh, however, today there, there are still problems or gaps in the combination of federalism and democracy in Brazil. The main problems or gaps in this relationship lie in capacity to safeguard the equality of the three federative levels in terms of autonomy and interdependence. And finally, my third main argument is the central challenge of the Brazilian Federation is to reduce territorial power inequalities. It's my point in this presentation. In the Brazilian case, territorial inequalities links democracy with federalism. It's my main thesis uh, in this presentation. Why is it so relevant? Um, because uh, a, a, balance, a balance combination between democracy and federalism requires equality among citizens and at the same time among federal units, uh, people and places. The three inequalities that they shape the Brazilian federation are regional socioeconomic inequalities, inequalities that divide from problems in um, intergovernmental forums, intergovernmental councils, and finally, inequalities in subnational state capacity. What are my basic conceptual assumptions? Um, there is no perfect or unique match between federalism uh, and democracy. It's always a contestual and incomplete, incomplete marriage. But there are evident kinds of coupling between federalism and democracy. This is what happening in the Brazilian case since, uh, since uh, redemocratization. Um, well, of course, where are, there are also tensions and gaps in these uh, relationships. Uh, relationship. The solutions depends on the, the capacity 
to balance autonomy with interdependence, according to the main problem in each federation. In the Brazilian case, the central issue is territorial inequality. I think that democracy, um, uh, when I, I, I saw the historical trajectory of federalism and democracy in Brazil, uh, I think it's important to define democracy. I think that democracy must be understood in two aspects, uh, citizen participation and horizontal checks and balances. In the Brazilian case, since its origins uh, as a monarch, autocratic, uh, oligarchical, authoritarian models, and military regimes, a uh, kind of Praetorianism, were hegemonic or combined over, over time. A democratic regime in Brazil, a democratic regime by the book, uh, is recent and started with redemocratization less than four years ago. And what can we say about the territory of the Brazilian Federation? Well, as a nation, Brazil was born as a unitary state, not as a federal state. And only 70 years later became a federation. However, the Brazilian Federation model had many, many difficulties to conciliate autonomy and interdependence over time. And in general lines, two federative paradigmas were hegemonic. And the first, the, a, a centrifugal pattern of federalism with um, low intergovernmental coordination or a, an exacerbated a uh, uh, big centralization with reduced subnational autonomy. Um, well, in Brazilian history, changes with redemocratization. Uh, it's possible to, to speak about uh, marriage between democracy and federalism uh, only uh, with democrat redemocratization. And the 1988 constitution inaugurated a new era, ensuring horizontal and vertical checks and balances. In relation to democracy, Brazil has had free and regular elections with the constitutional control of governance by Congress and the Suprema Court in Brazil, Supremo Tribunal Federal. In relation to federalism, the autonomies of the subnational governments were guaranteed include the transformation of the municipalities into federative entities. Besides, federative subguards were created uh, in uh, 1988 constitution. And finally, the, the channels of intergovernmental participation uh, in national decisions were increasing. I, give, I, give, I can give it uh, three recent examples of coupling between democracy and federalism in Brazil. The first example uh, was defense of subnational rights in the Suprema Court, uh, Supremo Tribunal Federal, during Bolsonaro's government. In the case of the pandemic when the legal competence of the states and the municipalities was guaranteed to act in health with autonomy in relation to the federal government. It's a, a important case to demonstrate the, the power of, uh, uh, to, to demonstrate the, the marriage and federalism and democracy in uh, Brazil today. Second, second example is about the national public policy systems, especially in health. We have federative councils with three participation, yeah, three levels of government, municipalities, states, and union, um, and decision. Yeah, three, part three part participation and decision. 
the existence of federative forums of the national health system was fundamental to reduce the impact of President Bolsonaro's negationism, helping states and municipalities to take the right measure, measures during the pandemic. The third example concerns a, a federative horizontal cooperation between municipalities and states. Uh, two cases, uh, interesting cases, the cases of the river basin commits and the, and the Northwest Consortium with participation of nine of 26 states of the Federation. These are two very interesting cases of horizontal federative cooperation in Brazil. I think it's a, 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 a the merge and between demo, democracy and federalism uh, has a, a good example in uh, horizontal federative cooperation. But what is the main weakness of the marriage between federalism and democracy in Brazil? I think the better answer is uh, the federative inequalities. There are three types of um, federative inequalities. Uh, the first type is uh, the regional socioeconomic inequalities, which make citizens win a call to, to be the other and require a greater redistributive action by the union, by the federal government, without which federalism would not be coupled to democracy. Because if uh, does exist uh, a, a equality to person, it's impossible to exist a equality to places. Uh, however, the federal government, it's not always successful in being effective and efficient in its redistributive action. And many times it lacks good cooperation with subnational government. I will now speak about the second type of federative inequality. There are two major asymmetries um, in intergovernmental relations with greater power for the union and great fragility of local government in relation to state governments. I think it's important to say about the democracy in subnational governments, in relationships between state governments and local governments. Uh, it's important to, to think about democracy. Democracy uh, is not about only about uh, the relationships, the, the, the relationship, uh, the federal government with supranational governments. It's important to remark the, the importance to um, the relationships and between local government and state governments, especially in Brazil, because municipalities are a, a kind of uh, a federative unit. It's important to understand Brazilian federalism. Uh, these are territorial inequalities derived from the uh, institutional design and the political power of it level of government. Um, well, for instance, federative forums or councils do not work well in most public policies. It's important uh, to uh, think about uh, the question of democratization, the federalism in Brazil. So the success are for now exceptions. Um, education, for example, does not have a national system of public policies. When, and when the Bolsonaro government uh, didn't want to coordinate education policies uh, in a very nickel country, the poorest students suffered the most. This case shows how if federalism doesn't or if, if federalism doesn't work in Brazil, it affects most people, 
That is, it affects democracy. So the question of territorial inequalities in Brazil affects uh, both federalism and democracy in Brazil. It's very important to understand uh, the marriage in between federalism and democracy in Brazil. The third type concerns to local state capacity. Uh, even though Brazil has made robust decentralization to states, and especially municipalities, most, most local governments have low state capacities. I think it's uh, an important issue to debate the relationship uh, between democracy and federalism. As public services have been decentralized, it will be very difficult to reduce inequality between people. This issue is the question of democracy. Uh, um, how Sonic uh, said uh, uh, minutes ago, it, it will be very difficult to reduce inequality between people if local government do not improve their state capacities. I think it's, it's important to um, remark because um, it, it's important to uh, link politics and policies to think about- Abruzio, five, five more minutes, please. Okay, to, to relationships, democracy, and, uh, and federalism. The issue makes the role of state governments, especially the federal government, in creating state capacities in municipalities is very important. What do you, what do, what do, do you do to improve the marriage between democracy and federalism in Brazil in the future? What kind of um, questions are important to improve the marriage between democracy and federalism in Brazil? Um, it's necessary at the same time to ensure the autonomy and protagonism of the subnational government and have an effective and democratic federative coordination by the union to address um, territorial inequalities. In other words, it's necessary to have a, a better balance between autonomy and interdependence, interdependence in the Brazilian Federation. But it's not easy because there is an intergovernmental paradox. I think it's important to, to remark uh, this intergovernmental paradox, uh, to think about uh, the marriage between democracy and federalism in Brazil. What's the intergovernmental uh, uh, paradox? Subnational governments need to have greater state capacities to be more autonomous. And for that, they depend on the federal uh, 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 um, actions to um, uh, building a state local government. It's a, a paradox. It's an important paradox to think about uh, the marriage between democracy and federalism in Brazil. Um, I conclude by saying that the best way are incremental solutions for the marriage between federalism and democracy in Brazil. Um, the Brazilian Federation will take time, it take a long time to, beca to become territorial more equal. There is not quick and simple solution. But it's possible to start a federative improvement path. We will make the marriage with democracy stronger and longer. There are five reformist paths that follow an um, incremental paradigm to improve uh, the marriage between democracy and federalism in Brazil. First, make federative councils more balanced in the relationship 
between government levels. It's, uh, it's important because uh, there are many asymmetries uh, between union and subnational government in uh, the most of federative councils in Brazil. Second, expand public policy councils to cover all dimensions of government action. It's important because education, transportation, and so on, the most of public policy uh, don't have uh, a, a, a federative councils. Three, create federal policies for redistribution and support for the creations of uh, local state capacities in a more cooperative style. I think it's important to say in a more cooperative style uh, through a long-term territorial reduction plan. Uh, Brazil needs a long-term territorial reduction plan uh, and its question is a kind of link again between democracy and federalism. Um, besides, encourage a culture of negotiation and cooperation between the various federative actors, whether policies or bureaucrats. I think institutions, institutions matter, it's true, but I think it's important to change uh, the relationships between relationship between federalism and democracy it's important to change the, uh, the mindset of politicians and bureaucrats. And finally, expand the forms of horizontal cooperation between subnational governments so they can build a more democratic, bottom up way of federalism without abandoning the necessary partnership with the union in an inequal country like Brazil. It's important to combine uh, um, the uh, uh, bottom-up way of federalism with the uh, relevant role of union to combat the uh, territorial inequalities. Well, I hope I have been able to show very quickly uh, I'm sorry, Eduardo. Uh, the SSI of the Brazilian case and carry out, carry out a, a dialogue with the more general debate between democracy and federalism. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Abrucio. Thank you so much for your talk. So I would suggest maybe Perhaps we could have at most three questions or comments considering our time, because after this session, I think we'll have our break. And after that, we'll have the next session, maybe. Okay. Three comments, questions at most. It's not the same to say one big comment. So three comments. <laughs> Okay, please, Professor Norbert. Thank you very much for the presentation. So it was a theoretical uh, approach. Uh, I don't hear you. Uh, uh, couldn't hear you, Abruzzo? No. Oh. Okay, one moment. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation and the more theoretical approach and the more uh, the approach for Brazil. Um, for me, it was important. You see, I have a proposal for local government. So for me, the federal level is sometimes where you see in Germany in particular, because we have this cooperative system, where you see at the <laughs> what we what we say at the at the at the lender level, they have sticky fingers. 
because the money coming down to the city sticks at the, uh, at the regional level and is not going down to the local level, uh, finally. So mm -hmm. that this question of unfunded or underfunded mandates is very much very important, but it's also important when it comes to this kind of institutional setting. Mm -hmm. And that is a very important thing. And so for me, of course, what uh, Fernando mentioned very much is this kind of, uh, you mentioned territorial reform. That is very complicated, I tell you. I mean, we had in Germany and a lot of countries, we had a lot of problems with this. But uh, with uh, the cooperative uh, uh, federalism, what we have in Germany or in, Fra or in Spain, or in, I lived five years in South Africa, you could see it probably. It is, of course, a very much a question, and Fernando is mentioning of the competence of the of the knowledge of the administration, and there uh, I already mentioned it in other places. It's very important that we come back to to a public administration which is well trained, well developed, which is rule oriented, not so much the old new public management with a lot of autonomy, but it's very much also has to focus on this kind of knowledge at the local level. That's for me the very important thing. And mm. uh, this is uh, not only, I mean, we heard that about the implosion and the problems now finding, finding personnel at the local level. It is a very tricky thing now, especially in uh, uh, when, when we need this well-trained stuff. Okay, thank you, thank you, Norbert. I think the, the question is, is, is put up both uh, uh, lectures, so I maybe for you and also to Fernando, so you can also answer, hi, um, Yeah, I would just say thank you for the, uh, for the comment. Um, I, I think in, 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 in many ways, um, Fernando uh, presented was also a much more interesting illustration than what I, <laughs> I hope it was hel helpful nonetheless. But I think there's the, the, that if I could just pick up one thing that um, um, because w the issue you're speaking about, I think t it speaks very much to what Fernando was r reporting on the state yeah. capacity. And I thought that was very interesting compliment. Fernando, please. Hey. I think it's uh, a difficult question because how to democratize uh, federal interdependence? Um, um, they think it's, it's it's very necessary in in a confederation, and I think how to democratize federal interdependence is one of the issues of federalism uh, today. There is no s single solution. But I think that changing the mindset of political politicians and public officials is very important <laughs> because um, the question of um, uh, democratization, the, the inter inter federalism interdependence, it's a question of public administration too. It's not a question of, about only institutions. I think it's important too uh, to democratize uh, federal councils, as uh, Juana has demonstrated in her studies. But um, finally, uh, but it's important to, to say, uh, especially to academics in Europe or United States or, or Canada, and the tradition of centralized federalism in Latin America is stronger than another federalism in, in the world. It's important to say because in, in, in Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, the power of federal government is um, enormous, is <coughs> big. And I think it's important to, to change this tradition. Tradition, um, the solution for long tradition is incremental reforms. I, 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 I don't believe uh, in a um, uh, quickly transformation in a long tradition uh, as a, uh, centralization in Latin America. Thank you, Bruce. Hopark, please. Uh, thank you very much. I have a question for Yared. Uh, I do agree with you largely that uh, federalism is a set of tools to fix a prop, you know, to deal with conflict and problems. 
problems don't often uh, don't don't always go away and conflict always doesn't go away, but it, but it provides a tool for managing conflict uh, you know one of the things you and so you know a, a federal system is always uh, work in progress right uh, in, in that sense uh, and one of the things you say in your presentation is that uh, in, in this context you know you need some slack in the system you know solution is more autonomy uh, so my question to you is uh, when there is the op when when there is a conflict and there is an uh, when there is a conflict and you have the option of an exit, can you think of any example where that option has not been taken? Has not been taken. <coughs> any federal system where you have a constitutional option that allows a constituent unit to leave, mm -hmm. and it doesn't. Because to me, it seems as if, you know, has not been taken. Because in my, as far as I can think, whenever the exit option exists, it is a disincentive to actually try and find a solution within, within, within the existing uh, federal I, I, system. In fact, I would say that the, the, the jury autonomy does, in fact, the effect is typically traced to a territory. Yeah, I mean, I, I can think of three, three constitutional uh, constitutions yeah. where the the exit option existed mm -hmm. and in all three cases it was taken but in practice it was taken yeah. 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 So, so i guess i guess um maybe i hurried a little too much in between uh, uh so you need an exit option right but i don't mean that in only in the sense of secession i think one of the benefits of and I guess what I meant to say was in the wider sense. Exit also a sense of slack possibilities for unilateralism to do the kinds of things that federalism offers for democratic experimentalism, um, compensatory federalism, or redundancy. You know, sometimes there's a talk about federalism being expensive, but implementing the same bad solution ever everywhere will be also quite expensive. So sometimes you can either have containment of bad solutions or policy learning. So th those are the, all the kinds of things. What I meant with having that possibilities of of, of 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 slack and scope. However, and I should have underlined that a bit better, uh, playing with Hirschman, which is nothing original, right? But is that there's also voice, right? The exit's only one option, and that can help in negotiation situations. We know this from game theory at, in the shadow of veto. You don't have to use them. Nevertheless, maybe I'm too normative, but I think voice is very important. And then we get into, I think, um, also one of Fernando's points, uh, institutions are not everything, at least not in a formal sense. I mean, we need also sort of spirit and commitment yeah, and I would agree completely to that point. I, I did not say that clear as clearly as Fernando, but I, I fully would un, would would agree to, agree to that. I mean, uh, in a sort of as a follow-on point, if I may take it, working in a lot of uh, these. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, one of the things I realize more and more as we work in new democracies, new federations, is that in a lot of these a lot of these contexts, constitutions are merely pieces of paper. But in order to build uh, a resilient, successful state requires leadership. Mm -hmm. and, and quite often, uh, when, when external actors uh, you know, invest in trying to democratize or to, uh, uh, to, uh, to, to federalize or decentralize these countries, they don't invest enough in leadership development. For most it is, you know, we've got a constitution uh, that everyone has reached, and that's it. But this process of leadership training, I think, is something that uh, that requires much greater emphasis on in the future. The change of mindset. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Very important. Well, if the audience does not have any other question, I will use my discussion power to do a question. To <laughs> so I was wondering, uh, Jar. Uh, I know this maybe this this division between this, this, holding together federations and coming together federation could be so very normative, but I was uh, hearing you you talk and thinking your model could be applied for the both types of um, federations. For example, 
in, in the case of holding together federations, you have it's, it's, a, it's a, the central power, the national government has a lot of power in order to maybe to impose rules or to enforce, uh, overload the subnational government. And it seems to me that your model, theoretical model, is most, uh, or, or I would say, close to just, uh, coming together federations and my question is, is this possible to apply the model to the whole types of federations? Okay, and um, yes, thank you for the thank you for the question. I, I would, off the bat or so, uh, immediately, I would say, well, it should apply, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the <laughs> but what would be the details of making it apply? Right, that's that's the yeah. Because um, no, that's 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 fair enough. Um, so if if I go back to the slide where I said we showed, on the one hand, the commonalities between federalism and democracy, they share principles but different points of reference already there and you're i think you're correct especially there it looks more like coming together federalism saying things like you know equal units of territory and so on and so forth that's the u.s and swiss model those older um coming together federations um it will the long story short is in the relationship between federalism and democracy as coupling arrangements looking at rather separation or sharing of powers, separation or sharing of in democracy and in federalism in order to find patterns. There I would say that's completely antagonistic, I think, to whether the, it is a coming together or holding together federation. Because the concern there was how do you map what, the, what kind of federalism it is in the sense of division of powers and so on and so forth. And the same with the type of democracy. So let's take, um, I don't know simply enough about the Brazilian case yet, <laughs> but the Belgian case, I'm a little, which is, a, which is a typical, meanwhile, holding together federation. And there you could easily adapt the, the, the Belgian case. You would have to do it at different points in time, though. That may be the difference. In the 90s, it would clearly be a tightly coupled system. And over four or five constitutional forms, now it's more dual federal than the textbook case like the US or Switzerland. Um, so that might be a complication maybe in time. You know, when, when do you map it as more separation or sharing of powers federalism? Footnote, to be completely transparent, your question prompted another complication already analytically. What would you do with an asymmetric federation? And that would fits very well to your question why it's not as neat for holding together federations because those would be the ones that might typically first disaggregate more asymmetrically. So the answer is a good question. I need to think think about how would you map that better. One observation, Eduardo. I'm thinking about uh, loyalty in the Richmond model. Uh, it, it's it's very interesting because um, loyal concerns about. Um, um, transformation of leadership and concerns about um, combat the inequality territories. And Lyot, it's not common to, to, to study federalism using the Lyot as a um, key aspect to understand federalism. I think it's, it's intense to, to, to understand uh, hold together federalism is more important, the question of lawyers. And I think it's more important to, to think about the change of mindset in the new global order, in the new era, and important to, to, to think about the, the question of inequality, uh, the territorial inequality. It's, it's important to Mexico, India, Brazil, so the question of loyalty is, is, uh, should be recuperated uh, in discussion about federalism. It's a little point. Okay, thank you so much, Eric, for your talk. Thanks so much, Professor Fernando Brusso. So now you are ending this session. 
I think now we will have uh, our break, yes? So we will have our break now. We will have some snacks and coffee and water if you want, please. We will, next, we will, we will come back in 50 minutes. 50 minutes. Thank you so much. porque Marcelo está con un que no puedo viajar desastre ¿Eh? así que no problem flag color the Argentina flag yes now the problem was the, the bureaucratic uh, Mexican bureaucracy those excellent Yeah. 
Because <laughs> I thought about that. Someone's going to get the short end of that. <laughs> or, or, the new, or the new, or the more modern one. Or it's the most modern one. Because it's... <laughs>
Hello. Hi, everybody. Let's resume the session, please. Thank you. Thank you. You don't have to read the disclaimers. <laughs> you know? Okay. Not now. But I'll keep it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for tomorrow. So, please take your seats because we are going to continue uh, with this uh, final, final session for the day. Um, we will have a presentation by Elizabeth Al Albert with the title Federalism and Democratic Innovations. Okay, can we, oh, okay, yeah. So uh, thank you very much, first of all, <laughs> for having me. Um, it is really a very great pleasure to be here, um, to be in Brazil, in the country where actually uh, participatory democracy and democratic innovations uh, were born. Uh, we all know about participatory budgeting, we all know about Porto Alegre, we all know how uh, these ideas traveled to other parts of the world. And uh, I'm really, really happy to uh, learn a lot more on all the other forms of uh, participation, participatory democracy, institutional innovation here in Brazil. And thank you uh, to Eduardo, Rogerio and Johanna for having me and uh, for inviting me to this uh, symposium. So lots has been said uh, during uh, the day. It's uh, never easy to be in the last session, but there is one advantage obviously of being in the last session is that uh, or a challenge, depending on how one would look at it, that uh, you have the chance to uh, spontaneously refer to other relations <laughs> and try to link, uh, let's say, what uh, I think I understood from other <laughs> talks, uh, whether we are on the same page um, or not. So the title of uh, my uh, presentation is uh, uh, Federalism and uh, Democratic Innovations. Um, I will shortly explain why I used the terminology, terminology democratic innovations and not participatory democracy. And more generally, this topic is a topic that is studied at UREC Research by a research group I coordinate that studies in general participation and innovations. Um, so how institutions do uh, reform themselves, whether they're willing to do so, <laughs> that's the big question. There is a whole bunch of literature that actually looks from a more public administration perspective into the fact uh, um, how can institutions reform themselves? Uh, I mean, the willingness to reform themselves is not always given. Um, 
and uh, on the other side, then obviously, uh, what the how Jared termed it, what 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 what's about the voice part? What about the participation part? And um, what I um, try to do is basically to um, challenge um, all of us uh, by framing and revisiting some traditional concepts. We have been doing that the whole uh, day, but I might break it down again uh, to a more um, empirical perspective. So that would then add up hopefully to uh, what has been said already until now. And um, I uh, would like us to uh, come also to a certain uh, aspect back to the question already um, Ellen uh, posed forward, is, is democracy enhanced by federalism? Or does federalism enhance democracy? So are democratic innovations enhanced by federalism? What does that mean? or vice versa, does federalism or do federal structures uh, uh, permit actually the uh, institution, institutionalization of uh, democratic innovations? So that's a bit uh, the food for thought. Uh, and obviously the questions that all um, come up are again, what kind of federalism <laughs> federalisms are we talking about? Are we talking about new federal states? Are we talking about coming together or holding together than the rationals and all the questions I pose might obviously have uh, um, different uh, perspectives and might have different um, answers to it. So what uh, what is the state of the art if we take, let's say, the key uh, words of uh, the talk um, I, I, I share with you? Um, one is democracy. So I saw that bring just um, as I remind um, ourselves, uh, you might all know this um, report by VDEM, Varieties of uh, Democracy. They uh, produce always the largest uh, data sets. And I had a look at, uh, at the one uh, from 2023 and 2022. And let's say, summing up um, what we have in there as a data tells us first that the levels of uh, democracy enjoyed by an average global citizen is today down to 1989. So, we are definitely in an era of uh, democratic uh, backsliding. Um, so the last, or in other words, let's say the last 30 years of democratic advances are now somehow not anymore present or um, being canceled or not anymore wished. <laughs> uh, you can interpret depending on which uh, take you uh, have differently, which verb you want to then second, the number of liberal democracy is down to uh, 34. There have not been so few since 1995. So that's the key point. Since 1995, uh, that's also kind of, um, in my view at least, if we assume that federalism should work um, based on a constitutional democracy and not ideally not without democracy let's say third um, closed autocracies are up from 25 to 30 and the most uh, common regime type in the world is actually an electoral autocracy uh, that's about 60 countries so the data of uh, vdem and four together all the autocracies now harbor about 70% of the world population. So 70% of the world population, according to uh, the latest reports of VDEM, actually live in um, uh, autocracies or electoral autocracies. Uh, obviously, there are some differentiations if you look into different world regions and so on and so forth. Um, so the big question is, OK, um, how can we build back or how 
do we wish to build back? Uh, can we do it differently? Um, how should we do it? Is it wished? Are also participatory democracy and democratic innovations, uh, let's say in a very provocative way, a hype scholars study? Or are there truly also means that the citizens really want to engage in? There is really little research on that as well. It's a bit of a frustrating note, I know. But, <laughs> but there's really little uh, research on that as well. There is a bit of a hype on uh, democratic innovations research, but um, we are not that sure about the fact whether or not citizens really want to participate and to give their time in all these new voluntary issues uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And obviously, crises. Um, I have to go with this. Sorry. And crises, obviously, then um, uh, add an additional layer of complexity on it. And crises are can be interpreted, I would say, as an amplifier of underlying social uh, frustrations over certain governance um, solutions. Um, we don't really know if the crisis actually is um, kind of just the, the amplifier of something that has been already there. So we have to obviously also to play around with uh, notions like uh, legitimacy in crisis governance. I've just, for those who are interested, uh, I've just put also the link um, to a big uh, project that analyzes actually all the European countries with regard to uh, crisis management and pandemic uh, consequences um, for the next three years. Also, Johanna Schnabel and, and her team is also part of that uh, project. So what is legitimate and how can we build back? How can we create, uh, let's say, innovation when it comes to uh, uh, democracy? What does the relationship uh, between federalism and democratic innovation tells us? So how can we map all this? Um, on the other side, uh, another reminder is obviously the, uh, the reference to the whole literature of, um, let's say, defending democracy at the one hand. We have been talking about federal democracy. We have been talking about what comes first, federalism or democracy. Ideally, they come together. And uh, we assume that they should be together. But there's obviously also uh, the whole bunch of literature when we refer to political participation that goes back to the late 60s, 70s, uh, which does not necessarily uh, coincide with the literature on democratic innovation, but uh, participatory democracy we have now, because that was, uh, that were, there were the arguments of Carol Patman and so on and so forth. And that all that bunch of literature obviously relates to, uh, I would say, social movements, protests, uh, civic engagement in general. And uh, we see that, uh, not uh, all over, let's say, um, the, the different world regions, um, groups, persons, peoples um, want to regain civic spaces. And it happens with protests that um, are everything else than, than nice, let's say. And uh, there is obviously also the big question how federalism um, coupled, if I may so, <laughs> um, either loosely or tightly or however we want to define it, coupled with this new phenomena of participatory democracy can actually also be a channel for all these uh, protest movements, the social movements that are very often also disregarded by um, scholarly works on democratic innovations, on deliberative democracy and such. So uh, this, uh, some uh, thoughts on um, 
this rather difficult topic because uh, one thing is obviously the classical studies of federalism and the other thing is the classical study of deliberative democracy, democratic innovations, participatory democracy. They do not necessarily speak to each other, the, <laughs> these worlds. Uh, so what we do, uh, what we try to do is to come up with, uh, <clears throat> with let's say, um, a bit of a um, work that tries to understand um, what federalism can learn from democratic innovations and vice versa. Are there analogies? What can we learn from each other? How can the other, uh, the one support uh, the other? And what links, obviously, both <coughs> is the fact of participation, is the fact of uh, voice, if you want to frame it as Gerund framed it earlier with, in, with the reference to the different, different uh, scholars, or participation, if you want to frame it also a bit more from an institutional perspective, from a legal perspective, for example, participation matters. So the big question is how, when, and who. Participation matters in intergovernmental relations. Um, we will hear a lot on that. We might also uh, challenge ourselves and ask ourselves, are um, the actors that are currently present in intergovernmental relations enough? Or how are intergovernmental relations, big councils, and so on and so forth, influenced by lobbyist groups? Big question. Again, participation matters. Um, stakeholders matter differently. Um, obviously, not easy to answer. En enough <laughs> for the sort of for a very <coughs> uh, for basically um, introductory um, thoughts. And um, I'll um, throw out some of uh, definitions, let's say, um, by saying that what, what do we intend, what do I intend by deliberative democracy is basically the underpinning that referring to the last, let's say, 20, 30 years of uh, scholarly work in deliberative democracy, what is one of the main argument is that it critiques the uh, majoritarian view of, of democracy. Uh, and it favors uh, any process that actually does public reasoning, that is based on arguments of pros and cons, and that is somehow uh, institutionalized um, as a complementary procedure uh, to representative democracy. So federalism um, does kind of the same, because federalism also obviously tries to uh, thus fragment the power. It's about power sharing. It's about diluting the majority principle. It's also about the creating pluralism and managing pluralism. And here we have, let's say, the theoretical um, um, nearness <laughs> of, uh, of this per se separate scholarly worlds, let's say. Um, obviously, there are tensions that Gerald already mentioned, uh, referring to the territories and the spaces, but then the people are in the territories and the spaces, and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, this is basically then the uh, theoretically uh, underpinning. Um, why uh, I referred to democratic innovations is the fact that actually it might be a very European viewpoint, but um, I have brought one of the most recent attempts, let's say, to uh, define democratic innovations, which was brought forward by um, scholars in, uh, in Europe. And um, I do find that this definition actually encompasses very well uh, the thought that uh, participatory democracy procedures has to be proceduralized, so it has to be channeled, it, there has to be rules, it has to be institutionalized, but it also has to be then embedded in the whole political system, and I will come to that in uh, a minute. So this uh, definition basically says uh, that democratic innovations are all processes or institutions, that are new to a policy issue, to a policy role or level of governance, and develop to reimagine and deepen the role of citizens in governance processes, 
by increasing opportunities for participation, deliberation, and influence. Many words. What does the empirics say? The empirics says obviously also a lot of things. Uh, <clears throat> again, scholars that do more empirically study democratic innovations point to the fact that all uh, uh, processes that um, involve citizens in decision making are, that those processes that involve citizens in decision making are meaningful if the decision making is close to the citizen. And here the link of federalism. Of course, if you have competences that are distributed to the lower levels, and if the citizens want to participate in face-to-face, -face, and we know that many of these uh, participatory processes are starting from the very local level, then actually it means like if you have meaningful decentralization, if you have federalism, then you can also meaningfully test uh, democratic innovations, ideally institutionalize them, so create a regulation, a law, or whatever it is, um, and not just institutionalize them, ideally, but also embed them into the political system. And this is the, um, this is the most recent uh, concept that has been discussed in, in scholarly uh, literature, that it is not enough to just institutionalize um, uh, democratic innovations um, in one level of government but also across levels of government that's also happening but one obviously has also to understand how these democratic innovations can be embedded in a uh, political system what is meant by that uh, but then it's obviously meant how do different stakeholders um, react to it where are the lobbyist groups in it? Uh, what is the role of the media? Uh, what is the role of the different stakeholders? Um, there is, uh, there is um, literature coming up actually that uh, very nicely um, uh, differentiates between inst institutionalization and em embeddedness of democratic innovations. And again, here is obviously the link to uh, the more, let's say, classical federalism studies, um, IGR, intergovernmental relations, the bodies, the instruments, the procedures, the actors of intergovernmental relations. If it is institutionalized, often it is not. We know often IGR are not even constitutionalized, um, loosely institutionalized. But again, also here, then the question is, um, yeah, it's not enough to institutional something. You have to institutionalize something. You have to embed it into the system. So this is, uh, this is the, um, the idea behind it. Um, I could refer to millions of examples, and I will not do so. But we can take them up in the discussion. Um, uh, what we, for example, did, because obviously up to now it was hopefully somehow clear how I tried to link different uh, theories and I uh, tried to refer them back to what we have already heard uh, today. But then the question is, is federalism really conducive to democratic innovations, to institutionalized citizen participation, yes or no? Because obviously there's many unitary countries where democratic innovations work perfectly. Also here in South America, I mean, Peru and Bolivia have some examples to my knowledge which are recent and, and very, uh, with very novel ideas. Um, France has the Debat Public, which is, uh, I mean, totally a unitary country. But still, um, we tried to test all this a bit in this project and where we basically analyzed all the alpine states so we analyzed france italy germany austria slovenia switzerland and tiny Liechtenstein. okay that <laughs> it's still it's still in the alpine so we took it but obviously it's tiny everybody knows everybody <laughs> 
And what we have found, I mean, is that if you do have a meaningful decentralization, or if the country is federal, at least in the Alpine uh, area here, then you do find also innovation when it comes to either laws or regulations um, with regard to citizen participation. There is uh, the model of uh, Vorarlberg, one land in uh, Austria, uh, that is very much studied and goes on for the last uh, almost 20 years. Uh, it's a citizens assembly that has been spreading over and it was born in federal Austria. And it also got constitutionalized in the sense that it entered the state constitution. So the state constitution was revised and uh, there is an explicit reference to the model of participatory democracy now in Vorarlberg and also now in Salzburg, other lenders, or with regard to Italy, for example, in those um, regions of Italy that, uh, that uh, have meaningful decentralization, managed to um, implement either ad hoc or some also with the regional law, uh, quite uh, innovative uh, models of uh, citizen participation. So this uh, would basically confirm, let's say, our ideal um, um, assumption that federalism and decentralization is conducive to um, the institutionalization of citizen participation models, whether or not they are sustainably embedded in the different systems. That's another question, because that depends on the political culture on the role the media have, on the role the stakeholders have, on the role the political parties have, because obviously uh, renewing and revisiting federalism and democracy studies series um, means also looking at the problems that political parties have themselves and looking at uh, what has been recently framed as intra party democracy. That's also deliberation element. Intra-party democracy is, is crucial to make also uh, democratic innovations uh, work. Because obviously the, the very big issue with uh, democratic innovations, at least that is how I would frame it, in the global so-called global north is that they are introduced so that the parties can kind of save themselves <laughs> kind of a savior because there is no way out and you lose trust and nobody goes to vote i'm oversimplifying while in the other uh, while in other area, uh, uh, in other world regions referring also to the discourses to the uh, to the talks beforehand like global south emerging federations this question is not really a question because in, 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 in emerging federations or in post-conflict uh, situations, you simply have to deal with decentralization, federalism, democrat democratization, citizen participation all at once. It's not really a question that you actually can uh, um, say, okay, you have first the party and the party makes democracy and vice versa. I mean, to, to, to really, um, solve or manage a conflict, I don't really like that much the solving verb because it's actually about managing conflicts rather than solving them. <laughs> um, uh, the discourses around, uh, that revolve around both federalism and the democratic innovations are very different when they concern the global north or the global south in that sense. Um, so, um, I can share obviously all these slides, I just brought all these, there's millions of databases also when it comes to democratic innovations that partially refer to decentralization and not, there's the Latino database which collects uh, almost 4,000 ca cases of democratic innovations in uh, South America, there's the Participedia webpage, there's the European Democracy Hub that has recently published really, really good country reports on uh, democracy decentralization in uh, Global South countries. And as a summary, 
we are back. So what I intended to do and the hope I somehow managed to do is uh, to uh, give some food for thought on uh, the relationship on the mapping between federalism and democratic innovations in Syrian practice. So a bit following uh, and going more depth or more into the niche from what uh, Jared actually uh, has introduced beforehand. Then I tried to point to the fact that uh, regulating uh, participatory processes is good, but it's not necessarily enough, and that it actually has a, a different meaning in uh, so-called homogeneous societies or so-called divided societies, because what are homogeneous and what are divided societies is another big, big question. So my very final statement, I've already said it a couple of times, is um, federalism and decentralization, according uh, to me and to us in Europe research, can be influential um, um, elements for embedding democratic innovations in political systems, and as always, the context matters. <laughs> so thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth. And now we will have uh, another presentation by uh, Katarina Segat. Segat. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, thank you for the invitation to, to talk a little bit about the Brazilian case. Uh, so thank you the organizers and everyone that is here. And I'm supposed to to give um, a brief overview of, about the Brazilian case. Uh, so I try to to bring to I divide my presentation in two parts. The first part I will um, explain uh, kind of the give a contextualization of the Brazilian case, and then I try to systematize a few research questions that I think could help us to debate uh, this topic, which. It's not exactly my my main <laughs> research <laughs> agenda, so I apologize, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I will do my best. So um, as I said here, I tried to bring a, a brief overview. Uh, is this okay? Oh, it's all, it's all. Oh, okay, okay. So, as Marta presented in the morning, uh, the 1980 Constitution, 80 Constitution, uh, universalized social policies and um, determine a model in which we have a decentralization combined to a national coordination. So, the federal government uh, has uh, like share powers in most policies. Um, and we had the determination of social participation in the 1980 constitution. As uh, you all know, uh, we were returning to democracy, so it was an important guideline to be included. Uh, and in the following dec decades, before I, uh, I will present uh, how we have participation at the national level and, and the local level, but it's important to, I think, to point out that the development of uh, the, the build and the development of the coordination of, uh, of the national coordination in the following decades included social participation arenas. So we have um, what we call the public policy systems that were developed. First, it was developed in the healthcare uh, policy, but then we have social assistance policy, and we have different other uh, policies trying to 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 adopt a similar model. Uh, even education now, it's discussing uh, the adoption of a system, and this system is based in national standards, revenue redistribution um, that it may be in the model of equalization systems and also project grants. Uh, intergovernmental arenas. Uh, so we have in some policies these arenas in which we have the representation of the federal government and also subnational governments. We have information and evaluation systems, and also we have social participation. So we have um, 
some councils. Uh, so at the national level, we have participatory arenas. One, uh, we have different models, different types, uh, and we have national councils and commissions uh, linked to the to this policy. So I, I, Eduardo asked me to kind of bring an example so you can have an idea of, for example, how it's a national uh, council organized. So the National Health Council makes decisions about different aspects of health policy, influencing Ministry of Health budget planning, and also monitors the ministry spending. It includes representatives of all three levels of government, state, federal, and municipal, uh, service providers, organizations that represent users, and health professionals. Um, the first question that I think it's important for us uh, to discuss that is, for example, in health, we have an intergovernmental arena in which we have the representation of the federal government, state and municipal governments. And then we have the National Council in which we have also the representation of the three levels of government, but they have different, uh, they, they make different decisions. Um, so I think it, 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 it's one of one question that the scholarship we have a few studies about that but i think it's something that could also could be more study that is uh what are the what are the role of subnational governments for example and national decisions thinking that uh we have um a restricted a restricted representation within national health councils of subnational government and in the intergovernmental in arena um, decisions are different uh, so they are decisions more related to administrative aspects of the implementation of the policy than the national health council that makes more strategic decisions uh, and have this fiscal kind of fiscal control of over the budget so i think that this is the first question that i want to point it out about the brazilian system is we have different spaces in which subnational governments in which we have intergovernmental um, relationships and in this case they have a restricted role and we have the participation of other actors um in the in the in these national decisions at the local level we have also different types of participatory arenas uh, we have public hearings conferences even the national level we, we also have uh, conferences i brought these two types that are they are very diffuse in the country ac across the country so we i i brought the local participatory councils uh, they are linked to different policies, so they are kind of uh, the same design of the National Health Council, but we have just these councils at the state, at the municipal level, in different policy fields. Uh, and they have the, they include the, the, the representation of social, social act, different societal actors, uh, but they do not necessarily include the directly participation of citizens uh, most of the time, or uh, I think almost in all, in all uh, most of the cases, uh, they include uh, the representation of um, organized uh, interest groups. So then you have a, a, a agenda uh, in Brazil to understand who participates in these spaces, uh, how they are represent, how is uh, how is the representation within councils. So I think this is one also one important topic that have been discussed a lot in Brazil. Also, uh, they 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 can vary in the their their role uh, in decisions, so they, they can have a, a, a role uh, affecting, pol uh, affecting decisions, uh, being uh, deliberating about decisions, but they can also be only consultative, and also they can vary uh, in, related, in relation to the, the control over, over spending, the fiscalization over spending. So, uh, so their role varies a lot um, among uh, councils and there is well the, the scholarship kind of divides between three types of councils and being the most institutionalized the ones that 
were induced by the federal government uh, and they they have a funding attached linked to their existence at the local level so i think it's important uh, to acknowledge that that even though they are very spread out the country they vary a lot and we had as elizabeth said uh the budget uh other local participatory innovations as the participatory budget that it was very uh well known uh, across uh, the country and in other places. Uh, what I think it's important um, that I will talk uh, a little bit uh, in the next slide is that uh, the this these uh, innovations were really were, were attached were explained like the explaining factor to for the creation of this. Uh, spaces were uh, the partnership. So uh, they were uh, kind of created um, in governments, um, in workers' party governments uh, at the beginning, but then they were g diffused across the country and then other explaining factors uh, were mobilized by the scholarship. Uh, so the scholarship um, highlights the importance of networks, also of politicians, non-governmental organizations, kind of um, circulating with this idea of this, this participation, uh, that participation was important um, and it was key for um, better public policies. And then we have this discussion that uh we had in brazil that we had early in the morning uh, that is challenged by marta in this paper published in 1996 that we had this assumption that decentralization was would foster democracy so these uh, democratic innovations were really attached to this notion that being closer to people would be uh would bring more democratic decisions and would um kind of um attend local needs and citizens needs uh would get would bring closer citizens and government so this was challenged uh, by marta and it was challenging the following decades as as uh we discussed in the morning this is not is this is not necessarily the case and also uh we had a great as i said a great a diversity uh, in these arenas in terms of who is represented, what are decisions made, what are the institutionalization of these uh, arenas uh, across the country and in different policy, public policy fields. Um, then, oh, but what I think it's important for us that we could discuss a little more is uh, this, you know, in the democratic innovations were studied uh by uh scholars from the participatory agenda trying to understand uh what i said who is represented what make what are the decisions they make how they were institutionalized but uh and even the 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 scholars that discussed the diffusion didn't discuss exactly the how and didn't consider the federal context in this diff diffusion process. So I think it's something that we could uh, discuss a little more, that is uh, how federal dynamics have influenced the diff diffusion process. Uh, so uh, these actors, these networks, this, uh, the, uh, the, these politicians, these leader leaderships, entrepreneurs, uh, how they circulate within a federal system. So how federalism influenced the, diff the diffusion of this process. Uh, one of the, the conclusions that was uh, was made uh, was made uh, is that uh, the federal induction was important. So the, the councils that are more institutionalized, they were induced by the federal government and uh, this is was key but we don't have uh, a, a, um, a huge discussion of horizontal process of diffusion of diffusion and of other networks how these networks uh, really work within this 
federal context. Uh, another, um, I think another important question is that um, national coordination, as I said, was key to induce, uh, so to induce the institutionalization, or at least the creation of these councils, uh, and this is trade uh, local capacity. So uh, Marta has uh, also a study about uh, the policy, the housing, and uh, Eduardo about other policies, showing that the federal induce, in, uh, inducements linking the funding to the creation of these councils was important to uh, the diffusion of and the creation of these councils at the local level. And this is a, a part, a dimension of a local state capacity. So this was key as other things that they were induced to create also plans, departments and uh, so on. Uh, but uh, something that I think um, uh, Adrian Lavalle has been uh, studying is that uh, we have difference among public policies, as I said, but also we have difference among states. So maybe we have the, the state level is influencing uh, the creation and institutionalization of this council. So I think this is a second import, important, I think, question that we could uh, discuss that is how uh, it, uh, how the state level can influence uh, this, uh, the, 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 the results, the outcomes uh, of the national coordination. So the national coordination is key, is important, but we, we, we could have an influence of the state level in the outcomes we, we find at the local level. Um, uh, and I finally, I, I try to systematize also uh, a recent uh, agenda that uh, is the changes that happened during the Bolsonaro government. So the Bolsonaro government restricted, restricted uh, social participation in policy formulation. Uh, Bolsonaro government promote different changes that uh, restricted the relationship with society and non-governmental actors. And one of them was uh, restricting social participation policy formulation with the elimination of uh, different councils and committees. It's even like kind of funny because uh, it, they, they eliminate all commissions and, and councils and then they had to come back because some of them they could not eliminate. So then they kept the ones that they, they, they could not eliminate and just eliminate the ones that were creations of the executive. But this is, the fact is that we had a decrease in the participation at the national level during the last four years. Uh, and also even the ones that um, that that is that kept existing that, that they were um, uh, they, they couldn't be eliminated they uh, they were they suffered changes in the representatives that were um, within they were uh, being the representatives that were included in these commissions and councils they they will they also um did not meet so often as before so they suffered different changes uh that restrict also participation so it was not only eliminating but also changing the dynamics and the representation within these spaces that uh, change how participation um, happened in the last four years. So the other question that I tried to bring, and I think it, it would be important for us to discuss and also to kind of um, thinking about in the future studies, uh, studies and uh, is the implication of those changes uh, there is like a theoretical discussion about if it's if this could be if Bolsonaro's change government's change could be understood as um, dismantling or not, and I uh, I don't want to get into this uh, concept because I think this com concept doesn't really fit for uh, exactly for the Brazilian case, but I think it's important for us to try to understand better the implications of these changes. 
uh, in the institutionalization of the participatory arenas and how supranational governments also interact with these arenas, how they have representations within these arenas, uh, both, uh, both at the national and subnational level. So we have changes at the national level, but federal inducements change, so maybe we could have effects on the subnational level. Also, something that could happen is uh, without uh, be, uh, without the channels at the national level, subnational government, uh, sub, uh, non-governmental organizations or other so social at all actors could influence, um, could act more on subnational level. So I think we still have a, 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 a open agenda to understand better. And something that I think a few studies have been trying to understand is why some policies were more resilient than others. So why in some cases we had uh, participatory arenas, um, we have, they, they, they persist and they, they were not so dismantled, not, not wanting to use this word, but they were not, uh, kind of they were not weakened um, and they and they kept uh, they they persist so maybe we have other and then coming back we have other explanations such as uh, policy communities or networks or capacities maybe we have other explanations for us uh, the difference between them uh, thank you I think that's all thank you Well, thank you very much, uh, Katarina. And now we, we have time for questions. <coughs> yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, it's working. I have two questions for you, Elizabeth. Um, firstly, I, I, I was thinking, um, you mentioned that federalism influenced the way how this um, innovation mechanisms can work. But my first question is, what is in fact does the mechanism behind of federalism influence on the way how this participatory or the innovation democratic can in fact work? Because I think it's, federalism is a so broad concept. So my, this is my first question. What is in fact, what is the, the mechanism uh, at work in this case? The, the second question we is uh, also considering the Brazilian experiencing is um, maybe we could refer to this uh, participatory instrument such as <laughs> laboratory of federalism. In many cases we had in Brazil different uh, institutionalization such as public but, uh, this is municipal public uh, councils. But my point is, uh, it's possible to think that the way how some local instruments were developed can be adopted by other levels of government. For example, in some cases, uh, um, state governments and even federal government Brazil try to implement so participatory arenas to build uh, or to play in different public policies, but in fact, did uh, transference from bottom up to the, for uh, higher levels of government did not work well. So this is my two questions to, to learn from your experience in considering other concepts, okay? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Eduardo, for the questions. Um, so what are, the elements of federalism that would um, then uh, be conducive or would be important for democratic innovations to work in a meaningful way. Uh, one element is simply the, the fact of the division of powers. Because if you have, if you organize a citizens assembly, for example, or if you organize whatever type participatory budgeting or whatever type of uh, uh, democratic innovation, uh, then the first question you get from the citizens coming is, okay, if I invest uh, 
two, three days or a week or online or whatever it is, time, then uh, I would like to know if you, you authority that takes the decision as last, really can take the decision. Or if it's just that I consult with you and you, that you ask me to come to participate, but do not even have the power actually then to implement the suggestions I give. That's the thing. So that it relates very, very, very easily to distribution of competences. So the more you distribute competences, we can then talk about legislative and administrative, whatever it is, but it's about the distribution of competences. If you as an authority, as a, as, a, as a public authority, organize a participatory process, then people that come invest time want to know if you, the organizer, is also able to then actually implement it. Or if you, as a last uh, resort to decide, have to go back to somebody else who will then maybe not do anything, and that creates a lot of frustration. So that's the competence issue. Um, and uh, just another example, this is very recent and uh, very unique, at least in the European panorama. Um, and correct me if, <laughs> if you have something similar, I'm happy to learn uh, from you. Um, very recently, um, a, uh, it's actually a regulation, so it's not a law actually, but it's a regulation that has been, the idea has been born in, this, in, in, in a group of scholars uh, in Italy. But now there is also a regulation that um, municipalities, so local councils, um, can enter cooperation agreements with single citizens or with group of, groups of citizens. So I, as a citizen, can go to the mayor or whatever, to any uh, local um, uh, entity, and say, like, um, I would like to make a cooperation pact a collaboration pact with you because I know that the building X in the city is unused and I would like to use it, but I would not uh, like to have the police coming <laughs> and kicking me out again. So very in, in very simple term, this, uh, this regulation, uh, it has a proper name in Italian, it's called Amministrazione Condivisa, so in, uh, in English it translates to shared administration. And this shared administration model actually uh, develops this democratic innovation even further because the citizens do not only participate, participate in consultative processes, but they become co-designers, co-creators. And that relates them back also to the whole bunch of literature that was developed by the, by the Ostroms in the US with the management of the commons. Um, so that's, that's, that's a yet other part I didn't touch on in the talk. But this is also an example that uh, you really co-create things then with citizens. Um, and it's, it's widely used. There's now about 300, 350 collaboration pacts which are going on in Italy. And there is some scholarly work trying to translate this also to other um, uh, European states at least, and this refers, and this with this sentence um, I come to the second point, uh, to uh, the principle of subsidiarity. We have been um, referring in the morning, but not vertical subsidiarity, but horizontal subsidiarity, which is a principle that is uh, um, very often in at least in European federal and regional states developed only by the jurisprudence, not so much explicitly mentioned, uh, but uh, crucial when it comes to democratic innovation and the involvement of citizens. It's I, I very often referred to the uh, principle of uh, horizontal uh, subsidiarity. Um, the second uh, remark uh, is linked to, to, to all the uh, the arguments and the literature written on scaling up. So is it possible to scale up democratic innovation? Is it possible to... Um, I, I do think that there are examples where it is possible. Not everything can be scaled up, obviously. Uh, not everything needs to be scaled up. Um, shared administration, as the example shown, uh, might be good also for remote areas and to repopulate and whatever it is, but not necessarily has to be scaled up. 
Um, but obviously this uh, scaling up uh, question you point to is heavily discussed for the last 20 years in the literature of the liberative democracy. And it totally, totally maybe not, but it, it, it very much resonates with the argument of federalism of as a laboratory of innovation, as a laboratory of experimentation and policy diffusion. Again, an, an analog analogy between the two. Thank you, thank you very much. Well, we have several people already in the list, so go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. Um, you see, the, the discussion on democratic innovation is quite old. I mean, it's a book from Graham Smith, so we had the same in Germany. Actually, there was a group around Philip Schmidt in, in, in Florence, and they developed, we developed together democratic innovations. And firstly, they focus on decision-making processes, but nowadays this has to be, I mean, in old days, it was already combined with citizen engagement in other forms, with co-production, and co-decision, which is uh, two sides of one coin. But what was interesting, and we, what I saw over the years, there were strong innovations coming from Brazil, from the Global South. You could definitely, you could see that, how it was implemented in Europe, uh, participatory budgeting from Porto Alegre coming in. And, but then over the years, it was a, a focus on digital and online and offline participation. But you could see the digitalization process was sometimes a problem for these new innovations. What you could see in Porto Alegre, I think, is what you can see also in other areas, participatory budgeting only as a kind of online, um, online instrument where you, where, you implement, where you have some ideas and an online suggestion box. That's not enough for the people. The old traditional thing with deliberation and co-production may be included, that was a much better approach. And I think that was a that was even a problem for the for the uh, for the process of participatory budgeting in some cities that it was online only i mean the consul we all know i like to see the madrid if you have been in madrid it's perfectly planned the the, the, the piazza the la plaza de españa but it, it was at the end problematic because it was only online and now for the last years there is a very strong trend and we are evaluating this is on mini public sortition randomly selection and then finally you may have a kind of referendum at the end that is a very strong focus but it's going into this direction and what i see is that these trends are very strong not only at the local level i mean you see it in france in a lot of local levels in germany now all the cities which had participatory budgeting before are now going to mini publics or assemblies and uh, this is combined with online tools, of course. And what you can see, this is also going to the next level. At the lender level, we have that. As an, a parallel instrument, randomly selected people with 100, 200 people in a lot of regions in Germany and in, in Belgium and in other cases. That is the new trend. It has a lot of problems, by the way. Our evaluation shows this. But this is the trend for the next years. I don't think you can see that. And then there are some more smaller innovations, how you can combine this with experts and so on. So there are some innovations coming on now, and but not all of them, I would say, I mean, some of them will probably not sustain for more than 10, 15 years because they, they, they are attractive, but they have also problems, but they are an interesting additional element for all levels of, uh, or at all political levels. Do you want to? Add or comment on, on that? Do you want to? There is not much to add. I can just <laughs> add that uh, the very, at least from the, the European sphere, the very institutionalized and only really institutionalized and embedded process we have for now is the one in the constituent German speaking constituent unit of the Belgium federal state. So that unit, Eastern Belgium has come up with a law 2019 that in essence says um, we have a model of citizen assembly that is totally attached to uh, the parliamentary debates so the debates of the subnational parliament of the german speakers within uh, belgium and it has it's a bit more complex but it has several rules that say um, that citizens can themselves decide the topic so they are the agenda setter 
Then they discuss the topic, I mean, um, shortage of health workers. That was actually a really topic. Uh, then that this is uh, discussed over several weeks and then it goes to the German speaking parliament and the parliament has to motivate why they would not or why they do actually take into account. So there you see that it's really embedded because it really has a cycle in there. And obviously it's, it's being evaluated and many of other things that are a bit similar, but a bit less, let's say embedded, have so-called sunset clauses so that you would have a law and that you would then evaluate it. And they all sometimes also include citizens themselves actually to evaluate the whole thing, which is crucial because if the citizens don't want to use it, why, why going on with it? Yeah, I would just add that I think here in Brazil, uh, they are very diverse um, across the, as I said, so uh, we have different types, for example, um, in the, we have Comité de Bacia uh, connected to the management, uh, based in committees in English, uh, that uh, they decide uh, about um, about that they just they they have uh, representatives of different governmental ag um, agencies and also from um, non-governmental organizations or civil society and they decide uh, about well different the, different decisions related to to a a, a river um, <laughs> but uh, the fact is that we we they they not often work as planned uh, because they sometimes don't have um well funding to 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 implement decisions so uh, I, I gave the example of the consoles that also vary uh so i think yeah but they they are very diverse so some of them make decisions and influence decisions uh, other don't, other, does, well, as this example doesn't have the fund. So uh, what the, is, the studies say is that the fa na national coordination was important to induce and funding. And so we have different features and dynamics for them to be diffused across the country and to really make decisions and be institutionalized and, and well, we could say, I don't know, by Elizabeth's term, and more in Babbitt. Thank you, Martin. So just a brief comment and a, a question to Elizabeth. Uh, I, I, I would like to stress, uh, uh, pr particularly for those that are not familiar with Brazil, that uh, um, I, I think that Catalina and Elizabeth are not talking about the same form of participation. Elizabeth is talking about direct participation of citizens in, let's say, demanding or, or formulating public policies, whereas Catarina is talking about a particular form of the development of public policies in Brazil in the sense that local state and federal level councils became part of the operation of uh, very important uh, public policies and it does not entail the direct participation of citizens in councils instead some um, organizations of societies are take seat have seats on these uh, on these uh, uh, public uh, policy specific uh, councils and some councils, councils in Brazil became very, very powerful. If the local level health council did not approve the health spending of that municipality, constitutional transfers from the federal government to the local government would not be made, which represented in some cases nearly 90% of the local level uh, budget. The social assistance uh, 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 municipal council in Brazil is in charge 
of approving which organizations can be officially recognized as charitable and uh, welfare associations. So this public, uh, these councils became very, very powerful. And needless to say that mayors hated all these councils because some of them believe that the problem of public management be appeared when public councils were uh, invented. And so this is, this is a, 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 a nightmare for <laughs> some uh, mayors because these councils became some area very, very powerful, powerful. This is, this brings me to the, to the question I have to Elizabeth. I was convinced by your argument that some local level autonomy to make decisions, competences to make decisions, is a condition to, uh, to let's say, uh, citizens having incentives to, to participate. But a, a, a big discussion in Brazil refers to the openness of the local level government to citizens' input, because in case that mayors or governors do not want to accept participation, so uh, decentralization or either federalism is not a, a sufficient condition because uh, they, uh, local level governments might have competences to make a decision about, but mayors might not want to, to and they have several strategies to impede, to, to avoid uh, participation. So did you control for that? Because it's very difficult to control for that, but it makes sense to, th to think in, in, in these terms. And we have some evidence in Brazil that even some obligatory councils were, let's say, uh, how can I say that? Misconducted, Misconducted. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, very shortly. Obviously, this is uh, <laughs> this is a really difficult question. I mean, this is this again. I mean, if we want to translate and look for something similar in federalism, then it's what is the federal political culture? Also, that is really difficult to measure. <laughs> Even more difficult to measure than actually empirically collect the, the data of who does what and why not. Actually. Uh, we have in single projects, obviously, you do have some evidence because you go with in-depth interviews and such things, and you simply see if there is, uh, just thinking of a law of territorial planning, which foresees at a certain stage in one paragraph that uh, the, 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 the use of the territory of a, of a municipality has to be resought, and at a certain stage, citizens of the municipality have to be involved. Obviously, it's at the mercy of the, of, the, of of every mayor or citizen council to decide what involvement of citizens means. Some do an evening, I inform you about the plan. Others uh, say, no, I invest a bit of uh, my budget, budget and I actually really would like to ask uh, the, the, the residents of my municipality what they would like to do with uh, for, for the next 20 years of the territorial planning. And this is, yeah, this you have to map empirically and then uh, try to build up something with it. But obviously, it's, it's very, it depends very much on the context. And yes, I mean, democratic innovation is an extremely diverse field. So it's uh, what I, I think we are on the same page, Katerina and myself, because obviously, apart from the beginning where you refer, referred more to the classical IGR perspective, then you refer to involving, let's say, stakeholders slash citizens slash interest groups in public policy or involving citizens through participatory budgets also direct. So that's, but it's really many different issues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And 
It's, uh, it's just, uh, I think, Marta, uh, thank you for your comment, because uh, I think we have a very diverse models of participation. So we have participations that include the direct involvement of citizens, but then we have different models that we are talking about some kind of representation within this these councils and even budget uh, even the participatory budget we have some kind of uh, and even the conference have some kind of representation because it's in it's it's kind of the way you can organize uh, territorial uh, interests and needs and demands but um, what i try to show is that uh, the decentralization allowed uh, democratic innovations, uh, but then we had these democratic innovations um, restricted to some uh, local governments, to some places, and this, zone, this was only diffused ac across the country. We have a moment of diffusion that was like networks, politicians, and then we have this spread out into other municipal governments, but this was only uh, diffused ac across the country with the, the linking of the federal endorsement with linking to funding, mm -hmm. and then this, um, this uh, kind of uh, obliged most mun all municipalities that want to receive funding to create these councils, it's like I'm talking about the councils now, but create these councils. Uh, but this was the case of some policies. So it's not the case of all, pol all policies. So in some other policies, they don't really work. Sometimes they, they, they only exist in the paper, but they don't really uh, work. Uh, and this, well, the, the, the studies show that this was key to kind of increase the state capacities, local capacities as, uh, well, when we are talking about uh, innovation in federations, we all know that they will be restricted to some places, um, generally, especially in an equal country like Brazil, they, were, they will be restricted to places that have more capacities or have a leadership or someone that has <laughs> a great uh, entrepreneur, like something, uh, a politician that have an idea, but it, it we won't find uh, this, uh, this, this kinds of innovations uh, in, uh, across the country. Um, accepting the invitation to think together, I was wondering if federalism uh, has a negative impact on uh, democratic innovations. Because, I've got to be very brief, because of technology that kind of deteriorate, it makes things more, less, territorial, less territorial, thanks. Uh, and the decision-making pro, uh, process is much more uh, fragmented. So not only should I put my uh, time and effort in one decision, but perhaps in three, that of the union, of the state, and of, of the local uh, municipality, the local government. That's it. Thank you. No, a, a, a wild thought. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the thought. And this thought would hold true, I, I would say in the case we really had um, compartmental federalism, but we don't have any more the watertight federalism kind, what we all know from theory. So, I mean, I can rarely think of competences that are super, super neatly distributed just to one level of government. So the challenge is obviously of this participatory process, especially if it's in decision making, uh, especially if it is linked to public policy making and it is embedded to construct them so that those that participate understand that they are a piece in, 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 the, in the whole puzzle or a piece in the, um, how do you call it, Zahnrad. Um, uh, Jared had the car. Okay. 
yeah. The big Jerusalem. <laughs> so I mean, that's the, that's a challenge because I I mean, think of climate. Uh, what is the primary citizen assembly? What is organized at least in Europe? Like every country more or less has a citizen assembly on climate change, <laughs> and there is also one organized uh, globally uh, in digital manner. Climate change is a policy. I mean, every level has to play a role, and if you organize a citizens assembly on that, key issue is make clear the rules for those who participate. It has to be very clear from the very beginning where, for what they participate and where the decision making is, is taking. So I would say it's a provocative comment, but it doesn't really hold true because we don't anymore have this watertight compartment <laughs> federalism type. <laughs> Three things quickly, if I may. Um, and uh, first of all, I was, I was a little puzzled at the beginning with, by some of the terminology. And um, I'm just wondering if we are being, if we should be perhaps a little more parsimonious in our use of the word innovations. A lot of what I'm hearing about doesn't sound like innovations to me. It sounds like certain type of practices that were innovated a long time ago perhaps a thousand years ago in Switzerland. So why are we calling them innovations? Uh, it's, it, what you seem to be talking about is the adoption of participatory practices. Uh, um, I was waiting to hear all the things about new things I'd never imagined or heard about, and there was nothing new in it. So it didn't strike me as innovations. Uh, but correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, secondly, Elizabeth, am I correct in understanding that essentially your analysis of these innovations in the studies that you did boil down to nothing more than the fact that federalism creates jurisdictions of a sufficiently small scale where these are feasible. And the third question is about, um, to use your word context, is this a, is there something particular about the context, the political culture and so on of that Alpine region that particularly lends itself? In other words, is this do we have a bit of a sampling error here? Uh, lends itself to these sort of developments. You mean, you know, participatory democracy thrives when there's a ski hill within 100 kilometers, that sort of thing. Um, uh, so three small questions there, if I could get authoritative and definitive answers to, that would be great. Do you want to answer? Yeah, first? can I just, uh, yeah. depends of the concept of innovation, because if innovation is something totally new, that then I think it's hard to find innovations in public policies. So I adopt a concept of innovation that it's, it's something new for that is specifically context because it's, yeah, well, I, I think it will be hard to find innovations. Uh, yeah, because, but, uh, but I, I think, um, what I can say about Brazil is that I think we have these innovations, but I think the step we are discussing is how we keep and institutionalize this. So it's a challenge of continuity, continuity and institutionalization of these participatory arenas. I don't think we need to kind of uh, be creating new, uh, new innovative uh, Part democratic, um, but I think something that we didn't discuss here, uh, but be early, uh, there was a discussion about that is the use of technology. So then I think there is like some innovations in the use of technology for participation. Uh, but then uh, the federal government has been using that to the planning they are conducting. So I think then there is an agenda that we didn't discuss that it's the use of technologies for participation. And but I, I, I it would be interesting to um, to to connect that with the discussion of federalism, uh, and then maybe uh, territorialization and how e this could be a challenge for the digital digitalization can uh, decrease these interactions in the territory so i don't know but i think it could be an agenda and but that's it yes and so in part katarina already answered on the on the innovation but alan try to ask a mayor 
if he thinks it's innovation or not, if he or she has to give away power. But it's definitely innovation <laughs> if you see it from that perspective. If you see it from the perspective of those who actually have to deal with relative complex um, uh, processes where they actually have to say, okay, I would like to involve you and I did not yet take a decision, then from that perspective, it is something unknown, uncharted waters they would never want to have. Uh, but of course, I mean, we can discuss uh, ours. The more pragmatic linguistic answer to your question of using democratic innovations as a word is, is, is as follows. Participatory democracy is used in all the countries that have Spanish, Portuguese, and Italian language. Mm -hmm. And deliberative democracy is used in Anglo-Saxon context. But if you translate deliberative democracy or deliberative practices to Italian, Spanish, Portuguese language, then you would not be understood because it has a totally different meaning. Because deliberare in Italian and in, in the languages I mentioned means to take a decision and not deliberate in the Anglo-Saxon way. So that is our Iraq's way, uh, way out. <laughs> of the dilemma because we work in Italian, German and English. So you rather say also democratic innovations and you don't have to deal with the very difficult uh, linguistic issue and with the conceptual issue that the liberty of democracy is actually the philosophical basis, let's say for participatory processes. Or then you might be misunderstood because participatory processes might refer to all the bunch of literature that actually uh, goes towards social unrest, civic movements. And those not necessarily are fans of democratic innovations. That goes back to the two fundamental differences. One, just to mention one, Helen Landmore and Claudia Schwalwitz, who say like democracy has to be totally renewed and we do everything by lot. And all the others saying that there is a point in democratic innovations to embed them as a part in representative democracy. And I think I spare the others for later. <laughs> okay, we might take a final question before we finish. Okay. No, yeah, right here. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. Then I won't ask you a question, Katarina, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll just say thanks for a wonderful presentation. Which, thank you, it was a wonderful presentation, both of you. Uh, okay, I, I, I thought that was a great discussion you opened up, but I guess I should put a lid on it, Rogerio, and we'll come back to it. <laughs> but I thought it was a great idea. Real quick then, um, so what, uh, what do you think? to flip the thing in another direction. Do you have a hunch or an idea? Not only does federalism have a certain effect on participatory democracy, does it work the other way around? Do you see democratic innovations in participatory uh, diffusion having a federal effect, if that makes sense? Thanks. I would say yes very short because the more I participate then the question is who participates but that's another issue as well but um, the more I participate the more I really want to participate in mean, mean in a meaningful way and that actually also raises the awareness of a political federal culture it's linked to civic education the context you need to prepare it otherwise it doesn't work but yes I mean I would say there is yeah, I would agree. Uh, in Brazil, for example, the cases of the consuls, I think they have implications in the decisions in the local policies and also then the powers of a local executive and a legislative. So then I think you have uh, implications to, to local autonomy. Uh, also, the question that I brought about uh, the at the national level, how subnational governments participate. So they, uh, they have an intergovernmental arena that make decisions 
uh, about more administrative decisions about the implementation of policies and then they have representations within national councils then they have to they have to dispute uh, with other actors and so so yeah I, I would say that yes but I think it's a very complex question an interesting question so I think it, 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 we could think about different ways in which this could happen. Well, thank you. Do you want to say the final words? Or? No? OK, so <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, those of you who are here. And thank you very much those who follow our discussion through YouTube. And we will see you tomorrow. I, I, don't don't know, know, yeah. I do not have a final word. Just to remind everyone that the seminars will continue tomorrow morning. We will start at 8.30. So we wait for all of you to, to follow this interesting discussion that we have in this session today. So thank you so much for your participation and hope to see you again tomorrow, okay? And take some rest and have a nice day, the rest of the day.